from the book jacket. In the Star Wars galaxy, evil is on the move as the Galactic Alliance and Jedi Order battle forces seen and unseen, from rampant internal treachery to the nightmare of all-out war. With each victory against the Corellian rebels, Jason Solo becomes more admired, more powerful, and more certain of achieving galactic peace. But that peace may come with a price. Despite strained relationships caused by opposing sympathies in the war, Han and Leia Solo, and Luke and Mara Skywalker, remain united by one frightening suspicion. Someone insidious is manipulating this war, and if he or she isn't stopped, all efforts at reconciliation may be for naught. And as sinister visions lead Luke to believe that the source of the evil is none other than Lumia, Dark Lady of the Sith, the greatest peril revolves around Jason himself. Chapter 1 Outside Corellian Space Star Destroyer Anakin Solo It wasn't exactly guilt that kept Jason awake night after night. Rather, it was an awareness that he should feel guilty, but didn't quite. Jason leaned back in a chair comfortable enough to sleep in, its leather as soft as blue butter, and stared at the stars. The blast shields were withdrawn from the oversized viewport of his private office, and the chamber itself was dark, giving him an unencumbered view of space. His office was on the port side. The bow was oriented toward the sun, Corel, and the stern was pointed back toward Coruscant, so he'd be looking toward Kaminor, Kuat, the Hapes Cluster, the length of the Perlemian trade route. But he did not try to pick out these stars individually. Astronomy was a lifelong occupation for people who spent their entire existences on only one planet. How much harder must such a study be for someone like Jason, who traveled from star to star throughout his life? He let his eyelids sag, but his mind continued to race, as it had every day since he and his task force had rescued Queen Mother Tenel Ka of the Hapes Consortium from an insurrection, instigated by treacherous Hapen nobles aided by a Corellian fleet. In the midst of all those events, believing that Han and Leia Solo had been part of the plot, Jason had ordered the Anakin Solo's long-range turbo-lasers brought to bear against the Millennium Falcon. Later, he had heard compelling evidence that his parents had played no part in that plot. So where was the guilt? Where was the horror he should have felt at an attempted act of patricide and matricide? What sort of father could he be to Alana if he could do this without remorse? He didn't know, and he was certain that until he did know, sleep would continue to elude him. Behind his chair, a lightsaber came to life with its characteristic snap hiss and the office was suddenly bathed in blue light. Jason was on his feet before the intruder's blade had been fully extended, his own lightsaber in hand, thumbing its blade to life, gesturing with his free hand to direct the force to sweep his chair out of the way. When it was clear, he could look upon the intruder. She was small enough that the chair had concealed all but the tip of her glowing weapon. On the other side of the desk stood his mother, Leia Organa Solo. But she did not carry her own lightsaber. Jason recognized it by its hilt, its color. It was the lightsaber Mara Jade Skywalker had carried for so many years. Luke Skywalker's first lightsaber, Anakin Skywalker's last lightsaber. Leia wore brown Jedi robes, and her hair was down loose. She held her lightsaber in a two-handed grip, point up and hilt back, ready to strike. Hello, mother. This seemed like an appropriate time for the more formal term rather than mom. Have you come to kill me? She nodded. I have. Before you attack, how did you get aboard? And how did you get into this office? She shook her head, her expression sorrowful. 
Do you think ordinary defenses can mean anything at a time like this? Perhaps not. He shrugged. I know you're an experienced Jedi, Mother. But you're not a match for any Jedi Knight who's been fighting and training constantly throughout his career. Because you haven't. And yet I'm going to kill you. I don't think so. I'm prepared for any tactic, any ploy you're likely to use. Now she did smile. It was the smile he'd seen her turn on political enemies when they'd made the final mistakes of their careers. The feral smile of a war dog toying with its prey. Likely to use. Don't you know that the whole book of tactics changes when the attacker is chosen not to survive the fight? Her face twisted into a mask of anger and betrayal. She released her grip on the lightsaber hilt with her left hand and reached out, pushing. Jason felt the sudden buildup of force energy within her. He twisted to one side. Her exertion in the force would miss him, and then he realized too late that it was supposed to. The force energy hurtled past him and hit the viewport dead center, buckling it, smashing it out into the void of space. Jason leapt away. If he could catch the rim of the doorway into the office, hold on there for the second or two it took for the blast shutters to close, he would not be drawn out through the viewport. But Leia's own leap intercepted his. She slammed into him, her arms wrapping around him, her lightsaber falling away. Together, they flew through the viewport. Jason felt coldness cut through his skin and deaden it. He felt air rush out from his lungs, a death rattle no one could hear. He felt pain in his head, behind his brow ridge, from his eyes, as they swelled and prepared to burst— and all the while Leia's mouth was working as though she were still speaking. For one improbable moment he wondered if she would talk forever, rebuking her son as they twirled dead throughout eternity. Then, as in those last seconds he knew he must, he awoke, once again seated in his comfortable chair, once again staring at the stars. A Dream or ascending. He spoke aloud. Was that you? And he waited, half expecting Lumia to answer. But no response came. He turned his chair around and found his office to be reassuringly empty. With a desktop control, he closed the blast shutters over his viewport. Finally, he consulted his chrono. Fifteen standard minutes had passed, since the last time he'd checked it. He'd had at most ten minutes of sleep. He put his booted feet up on the desktop, leaned back, and tried to slow his racing heart. And to sleep. Coruscant, Galactic Alliance Transportation Depot, near the Jedi Temple. The Beetle Nebula settled down to a landing on an elevated docking platform, adjacent to the blue, mushroom-shaped transportation depot. The maneuver was smooth and gentle for a craft so large. At two hundred meters, the Freebooter-class transport was an awkward-looking vessel anywhere but in space. From above, she looked like a crescent moon bisected by a knife blade. The blade point oriented in the same direction as the crescent tips, and her wide, curved stern put observers in mind more of fat-bottomed banthas than of sleek, stylish vessels of war. But that wide stern could carry large volumes of personnel and materiel, and in the moments after the ship settled onto her landing pylons, a dozen loading ramps came down and began disgorging streams of uniformed soldiers, many on leave, others, riding repulsor-lift-based medical gurneys, being guided to hospitals— from a much smaller platform, fifty meters from the Beetle Nebula's starboard bow, Jedi Master Kip Duran watched the event unfold. At this distance, he could barely see facial features of the new arrivals, but could distinguish enough to see faces light up with happiness as they recognized loved ones in the crowd below. 
and through the force, he could feel the emotion of the day. It swelled from the Beetle Nebula and her surroundings. Pain radiated from shattered bones and seared stumps that had once been connected to organic limbs. Pain flowed from remembrances of how those injuries were sustained and of how friends had been lost forever to battle. But more than that, there were sentiments of relief and happiness. People were returning home from battle, here to rest and recover. They were veterans of the extraordinary space battle that had so recently been waged in the Hapen system. Some of the veterans knew pride in their role in that battle. Some knew shame or regret. But all were glad it was over. All were glad to be here. And for a few quiet moments, Kip relaxed, letting the emotions from the other platform wash over him like a cool, refreshing stream in summertime. The muted nature of the sounds of welcome from that platform, of Coruscant air traffic not too far away, of transport and commerce from the adjacent depot, allowed him to stay comfortable, detached. Then he felt new presences in the Force, specific presences for whom he had been waiting. He glanced away from the depot and up, toward the origin of that sensation, and saw the jade shadow on an approach angle straight toward him. The craft approached the depot at a speed slightly faster than safe, then rapidly decelerated and dropped to a smooth repulsor lift landing atop the platform, mere meters from Kip. He grinned. Whoever was piloting, probably Mara, had either playfully or maliciously made the approach as intimidating as possible, the better to spook him into sudden retreat. Of course, he hadn't budged. He waved a hand at the shapes within the cockpit, indistinct behind its viewscreens, and waited. Soon enough, the boarding ramp descended, and down trotted Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade Skywalker. They were dressed simply, Luke in black, Mara, for once, in the standard two shades of brown Jedi robes. Kip offered a smile and extended a hand to Luke. Grandmaster Skywalker! Luke took it. Master Duran! And Master Skywalker! Mara gave him a nod of greeting. But Kip detected a trace of irritation or impatience. Master Duran! That's a new hand, I take it? Kip released his grip. I heard about your injuries. How does it compare with the old one? Luke held up his right hand and looked at his palm. The neural matrix is more sophisticated, so it feels even more like flesh and blood. But you know how a droid whose memory is never wiped tends to become more individual, more idiosyncratic? Kip nodded. You're not suggesting that a prosthetic hand does the same thing. It doesn't have enough memory. Luke shrugged. I don't know what I'm suggesting. Maybe through the Force, my brain developed a familiarity with the old hand that exceeded what's normal. Regardless, this one doesn't feel right yet. Meaning, Mara said, that he's dropped from being the most accomplished lightsaber artist in the galaxy to, well, still being the most accomplished, just a little less so for the time being. Aunt Mara? Oops. Hello, Kip. Master Duran? The voice was Jaina Solo's, and Kip looked up to see the diminutive Jedi at the top of the boarding ramp. Jaina? Kip gave her a friendly nod. He steered his thoughts away from the time years ago when he had fixated on her, when she was still a teenager, when he was a younger, more self-centered man who hadn't recognized that his interest in her was more about loneliness and self-appreciation than it was about anything else. Here today, he pretended that she had never meant anything more to him than the daughter of his oldest surviving friend should. She, perhaps, didn't have to pretend. Giving Kip a brief smile, she returned her attention to Mara. So can I take Zek and Ben to the temple now? Mara nodded. I think so. Kip, any reason to delay? No. He glanced to the left, 
where the nearby Jedi Temple was clearly visible, just past the Jade Shadow's stern. Unless you'd like to save your engines, I can just pick you up and set you down over there. He reached out with his hand, palm up, an overly dramatic gesture, and the Jade Shadow vibrated for a moment, moving under the pressure he exerted with the Force. Jaina gave him a reproving look. She turned around, and the boarding ramp lifted into place, concealing her. How is Zek? Kip asked. Mara looked unconcerned. He'll make a full recovery. The surgeons on Hapes were very proficient, but he'll be out of action for a while. Her expression became concerned. How many people know how it happened? Just me, for the moment. Kip gestured to the far side of the platform, adjacent to the depot. My speeder's over here. Once they were all moving toward his vehicle, he continued, I was assigned the investigation on this one. All lightsaber accidents that caused any harm to a living being had to be looked into, and any master on duty at the temple might be randomly assigned the duty of investigation. Mara's face set. Everybody who witnessed it said it was an accident. Kip nodded. Of course, and Luke's report makes it pretty clear what happened. So I should dispense with our customs? Not investigate at all, take the day off? They reached the platform edge in Kip's airspeeder, a long, narrow, yellow vehicle with comfortable seats in front and a back seat that looked as though it were scaled for children. Kip hopped into the pilot seat and extended a gallant hand for Mara. She gave him an admonishing look and leapt past him into the front passenger's seat. No, of course not, she sat. I'm just a little touchy about it, I suppose. My son has a lightsaber accident. Suddenly I feel the eyes of all the Jedi in the galaxy on me. Luke stepped into the back seat and settled behind Kip. So, what is this all about? Kip sank into the pilot seat, activated the speeder, and pulled straight back in a speedy reverse that put them within meters of the nearest cross-traffic stream. You don't want to sit right behind me. Trust me. He swerved, so he was pointed in the direction of the traffic stream's travel, and accelerated, as though he were playing a Millennium Falcon simulator, to merge with the stream. Why not? Oh! Caught by the wind, Kip's hair was pulled from where it lay within the hood of his Jedi cloak. Stretched to full length, its tips whipped mere centimeters in front of Luke's eyes, and occasionally tickled his nose. Luke slid sideways to the center of the seat. You've grown it out. Kip reached up to give his hair an indulgent stroke, then grinned at his simulated display of vanity. I've been seeing a lady who likes it long, and doesn't mind all the gray in it. Congratulations. So again, what is this all about? Chief Omas and Admiral Neofel wanted to see you on your return from Hapes. They asked me to bring you. You can opt out if the timing isn't good. Mara gave him a puzzled frown. Is this about what happened on Hapes? Sort of. Kip gave her a broad, trouble-loving smile. This time they want Luke to make Jason a Jedi Master. Outside the Corellian System, cargo vessel Breathe My Jets. Captain Urin Levent was an heir to the tradition of Han Solo. That's how she saw herself, at any rate, and she was indeed a smuggler. Nor was she a small-scale smuggler. Her cargo ship, Breathe My Jets, had hold space large enough to carry several Millennium Falcons. Nor did she always make solitary smuggling trips— some missions, like this one, were small fleet operations. Still, she was not rich, not even financially comfortable. Creditors, more successful smugglers, members of organized crime, now demanded their due whenever they could contact her, whenever they could catch up to her during Breathe My Jets's brief stays in port. She'd been threatened, 
She'd taken a beating at a landfall on Tatooine, and rumor had it that one creditor had given up and hired a bounty hunter to eliminate her, to demonstrate the folly of not paying on time. She needed this mission to go well. If it did, she could pay everyone off, start over. If it didn't, she might find herself in a position to describe explosive decompression in a first-hand account. Now she looked at the distant star Core L through the bridge's forward viewport as she sat slumped in her captain's chair. She sagged not out of defeat, but from habit and a deliberate attitude of indifference that gave her a reputation for being cool under fire. Though born to well-fed, well-tended middle-manager parents on Bespin, she now had skin like Tatooine leather and a craggy face that might have benefited from a drooping mustache. Grudgingly, she sat upright. Glancing at the undersized youthful hut in the specially designed co-pilot's couch beside her, she nodded. All right, Blotta. Put me on. Blotta flipped a switch on the control panel before him. A display there lit up and showed Captain Levint's face, a live holocam feed. He spoke in typically deep, gooey hut tones. Broadcast in five, four, three... He held up two fingers, silently signaling the continuation of the countdown. Then one, then closed his fist to indicate they were broadcasting. Levent stared into the holocam recorder. Captain to fleet. In a minute, I will broadcast the nav data for our final jump. That jump will bring us as close as the planet Corellia's gravity well will allow. And then one of two things will happen. We'll be jumped by Galactic Alliance forces, or we won't. If we're not... Congratulations. The armaments and Bacta we're carrying will earn us tidy profits. If we are, our instructions are clear. Break and run, straight down into Corellia's atmosphere. It's every ship for herself. You see your best friend being assaulted? You wish him well and get down to ground. Don't hang back and fight to free him. Good luck. She gave her viewers a brisk nod, and Blotta cut the transmission. Nav data? he asked. Send it. He did. The instant he did so, a one-minute cron timer appeared on both cockpit displays, counting down. It was just enough time for the fleet's captains and navigators to load the data and test it. Not enough time for them to waste and increase their jitters more or less as a single body, the thirty-odd ships and vehicles of the fleet accelerated, pointing straight for the distant, unseen planet. Those who had defensive shields activated them, and at exactly the same moment each cockpit crew saw the stars before them lengthen and begin the axial swirling that was the visual characteristic of hyperspace entry. This jump would take only a few seconds it took less than that. They'd been in hyperspace half the time they should have been when the stars stopped spinning and snapped back into distant points of light. Corel was larger, closer, but not as close as the sun should be, and there was no comforting sight of the planet Corellia directly ahead of them. Instead, there was empty space, decorated with the occasional fast-moving colored twinkle of light. Levint swore, but her invective was drowned out by Blotta's shout. Enemy ships! Chevron formation! We're toward the point, and the two flanks are falling in on our formation! Which one's the interdictor? One of the enemy ships had to be some sort of interdictor. A capital ship carrying gravity well generators. Devices that would project a gravity field of sufficient strength to yank ships right out of hyperspace. Blotta highlighted a point of light on his display, and it began blinking on Levint's display as well. It was just at the point of the chevron, directly ahead of Levint's ship. Levint keyed her calm. 
Captain Levent to fleet. Maintain formation. Match speed with me. Our only chance— On the sensor display, the crisp line of her fleet was blurring as each member craft vectored in a different direction. No, no, maintain formation! She couldn't keep the desperation out of her voice. The original orders to scatter only made sense if every craft was a short distance from the safe haven of Corellia. Didn't the idiots see that? We've got to run this gauntlet at high speed. Play that, came a voice over the comm. It was female and a bit rough. A close match to Levint's own. This is the real Captain Levint. Follow your orders. Scatter. This voice was calm, self-assured. Blotta nodded as if impressed. Sounds just like you. Shut up. Levint put her cargo ship on a new course, vectoring downward relative to her current orientation. Blotta offered up a sigh. It sounded like a bantha passing gas. At least they can't know which vessel is carrying which cargo. Since we're not the biggest ship in the fleet, they might not pay us special attention. Breathe my jets shuddered so hard that Levint's teeth clacked together, and Blotta shook like a plate full of Corellian spice jelly. The cockpit lights dimmed for a second. Frantically, Levint wrenched the controls around in a new direction. But Breathe My Jets was not a small, nimble craft. In the agonizing seconds it took the cargo vessel to take a new bearing, she heard Blotta calmly describing their situation. The ISD at the port tip of the Chevron formation is firing on us. The first hit was against our engines. If it hits again... Breathe My Jets shuddered a second time hard enough that Levint would have been thrown from her seat if the restraining straps hadn't been buckled in place. The cockpit lights dimmed again, and the displays all showed static for a second. The lights did not come up this time, and the cargo ship stopped responding to Levint's handling. The displays cleared of static. Running on emergency power, they began scrolling a list of damage sustained by the ship. Blotta watched the data roll by, Engines out. Thank you for that Hollow News update. Blotta shrugged. It's been good working with you, Captain. I only wish... Wish what? That you weren't half a year behind in what you owe me. He switched his main display over to follow the progress of the battle now raging all around them. Outside the Corellian System Anakin Solo In the command salon of the Star Destroyer Anakin Solo, Jason Solo stood staring through the forward viewports. He could see the last few twinkles and flashes of laser fire as this abortive space combat drew to a close. He chose not to follow the events more closely on the readily available computer displays. Instead, he reached out through the Force, sampling the ships and vehicles he could see looking for oddness, discrepancy, tragedy. He found none. The smugglers, outmaneuvered and outgunned, gave up almost to a ship. A few nimble craft got away, making the jump to light speed before the warships of Jason's task force could cripple them. But most did not. The majority of the smugglers floated helpless, their engines destroyed by laser fire, or their electronics systems rendered inert by ion cannons. Shuttles were now moving from ship to ship, picking up smuggling crews, dropping off the personnel who would bring the captured craft back to GA facilities, directing tractor beams. In another hour or two, this section of space would be empty of everything but a few debris clouds that had once been engine housings. Our agent would like to speak with you, said Ebik a dark-haired human woman with skin the color of desert sand. She was short and unremarkable of appearance, but had been of considerable help to him since he had been assigned the Anakin Solo. A civilian employee aboard ship, assigned to data analysis, 
she had demonstrated a knack for knowing what sort of information Jason would need and when, and for supplying it at useful times. He was considering whether she would be interested in trading her civilian's post for a commission with Galactic Alliance Guard. He could benefit from someone with her skills if she proved as loyal as she was dutiful. She had not quite materialized beside him. He had felt her walk up, but her approach had been silent. Perhaps she would also prove adept at stealth work. The question annoyed Jason. His mind was occupied by details of the capture of the smuggler fleet, and he needed to begin thinking about his upcoming meeting with the Corellian representative. Why would I want to speak with her? And please don't call her our agent. She betrayed her comrades for money. She is our temporary hireling. She is their traitor. She is nobody's agent but her own. Ebbick paused, then evidently decided not to address those last few comments. She didn't say what she wanted. But since she's already proven that she had one piece of information useful to us, yes, yes. Jason nodded. Where is she? Your office. Jason followed her back through the bulkhead doors aft of the command salon. Once in the main corridor beyond, they moved through a port side door into the office that served as Jason's retreat aboard the Anakin Solo. Waiting there were two people, a large man dressed in the uniform of ship's security, standing, and a woman, seated, though she rose as Jason and Ebbick entered. Jason looked into the weathered face of Captain Urin Levint. Yes? Levint paused, apparently put off by his distant, brusque manner. I simply wanted to find out if you had any requests, or, more to the point, assignments for me, before I left. Jason repressed a sigh. First... I'd never prolong a business relationship with someone who sells out her fellows. Second, you're lying. Levint flushed, but her expression did not change. All right. I mostly just wanted to meet you. Ah. Jason paused and carefully considered his next words. Levint? You now have all the time in the galaxy available to you. In betraying thirty-odd fellow smugglers, you have earned enough credits to pay off all your debts and start over, whether as a smuggler or something legitimate. You can cruise, you can frolic, you can relax. I, on the other hand, don't have time to spare, and you have now wasted some of it. I don't appreciate that. He turned to the security officer. Take her down to Delta Hangar, put her on her ship, and get her off my ship. Levint cleared her throat. Breathe my jets is on Gamma Hangar, and the engines won't be repaired for a couple of standard days at least. That's right. I'm claiming breathe my jets for the current military crisis. Jason pulled his data pad from a pocket and consulted it. Your ship is now the Duracrud. Duracrud? Levint practically spat the name. That's a stock YV-666, older than I am. It's a brick with wings and a hull that leaks gases like a flatulent hut. It's a fraction the size of Breathe My Jets and exactly the sort of vessel needed by a smuggler starting a new career. Our agreement, our agreement, was that you would receive a sum of credits. Ebbick, you showed her the transfer proof and gave her the data to claim it from the Bespin account? Yes. And that you would be allowed to depart on your ship minus her cargo. The agreement did not specify which was to be your ship. He fixed Levint with an impassive stare. Now would you care to waste any more of my time? 
The glare she turned on him was murderous. He understood why. He'd just taken her ship, her beloved business and home, and given her a hovel in its place. His father, Han Solo, would have felt the same way. But Urin Levint was no Han Solo, and Jason didn't worry that she might someday return to cause him grief. Her record made it clear that she had no goals, no drives, other than the acquisition of credits. She was nothing. Levint turned away, her body language stiff, and marched to the door, her security man behind her. Then, as the doors slid open, she paused. Not turning back, her voice quiet, she asked, What's it like to have once been a hero? Then she left, and the door hissed closed behind her. Jason felt himself redden. He forced the anger away. It wouldn't do to let an insect like Levint bother him. But clearly, additional punishment was in order. He turned to Ebik. My father used to have endless trouble with the Millennium Falcon. The hyperdrive would fail all the time and he'd tell the universe that it wasn't his fault, and then he'd fix it and be about his business. He nodded toward the closed door. Delay her in transit to the hangar bays. Have Duracrud's hyperdrive adjusted so that it will fail catastrophically after one jump. Yes, sir, Ebbick considered. Since she's a smuggler... She's not going to go anywhere with a single jump. Her first jump will always be to some point far away from planetary systems or traffic lanes. She'll be stranded. That's right. And she'll become intimately acquainted with her hyperdrive. She might die. And if she doesn't, she'll be a better person for the experience. More polite, probably. Yes, sir. Ebbick moved to the door. It slid open for her. Sir, your meeting with Admiral Antilles is in one hour. Jason consulted his chrono. So it is. Thank you. And, Colonel, if I can make a personal remark, go ahead. You're not looking well. He gave her a humorless grin. Crisis will do that to a man. I'll be fine. The door slid shut behind her. Chapter 2 Exactly an hour later, Ebbick returned, escorting Admiral Wedge Antilles of Corellia. The aging military officer, upright and moving as easily as a man half his age, wore the full-dress uniform of an officer of the Corellian Defense Force, and a grave expression that concealed his feelings like a mask. Even through the force, Jason could pick up little of what Wedge was experiencing. Alertness, confidence that might or might not have been forced, a patience born of self-control. Jason rose from behind his desk to shake Wedge's hand. He gestured for Ebbick to leave, and she did so without speaking. Jason resumed his chair and gestured to its comfortable high-backed double on the opposite side of the desk situated there just for this conference. Have a seat. Thank you. Wedge did, his posture perfect, and Jason felt a tiny trickle of annoyance. Wedge had to know that Corellia was beaten at this point. He could have the decency not to pretend otherwise. I know you don't like to waste time, Jason continued, so do you have a position statement for me? Now, at last, Wedge did look confused, if only faintly. A position statement? As in, it's clear the Corellian position is hopeless, so I'm here to talk sense. Wedge chuckled. I'm here because you suggested a meeting with a top-ranking representative of the Corellian military or government. You're here because, having achieved a military victory on Hapes, one that has been spectacularly covered in the media, and let me add my congratulations on that, 
You want to press your advantage and conclude a peace with Corellia to give your brilliant political career one more boost. Jason felt a flash of anger and instantly clamped down on it. Wedge's words hit close to their target. If Jason could negotiate a peace here in the next few days, everyone would benefit. Corellia, the Galactic Alliance, and Jason himself. You're not in a good position to make accusations about other people's motives and ethics. Not after signing off on the coup attempt at Hapes. He knew the anger in his voice was real. Wedge was silent for a long, chilling moment. Because I think you need to know, I'll tell you something that constitutes a Corellian government secret. I didn't know about the plot against tapes. You already knew I had nothing to do with its planning. How would I know that? Because it failed. Jason almost asked whether belligerent cockiness was part of the genetic pattern of all Corellians, but he resisted the urge. His own father was the archetypal Corellian, and if belligerent cockiness were credits, the Solos would be the wealthiest family in the galaxy. Jason gave Wedge a condescending look. You don't need to offer a defense yet. War crimes trials haven't even started. And if your negotiation is particularly skillful, they might not happen at all. So let's get back to the subject. Admiral, your position is hopeless. The Corellian system is surrounded, blockaded, despite the fact that numerous planets made noises of support when Corellia took its stance of defiance. Not one has rebelled in support of Corellia. You are friendless, and you're running short of crucial supplies. The smuggler convoy that you expected an hour or so ago is not running late. It is entirely in our hands, with all its bacta, all its munitions now helping the G.A. cause. Wedge smiled. First you say we have no friends. And then you say people were arrested trying to bring us essential goods. They were smugglers, not friends. Sometimes smugglers become friends. Your father and I were smugglers who joined the Rebel Alliance cause. And now, since you've seized those cargoes rather than paying for them, you can be sure that fewer smugglers will become friends with the Galactic Alliance. Are you saying that the G.A. doesn't need friends, or just doesn't need friends like me and your father? You're changing the subject again. True. Abruptly, Wedge looked weary, reflective. I'll be honest. I'd like to see Corellia reunited with the G.A. If it isn't, something very bad will happen. Now you're talking. If Corellia doesn't rejoin, if war truly erupts, I may never get my pension from the G.A. Wedge, I earned that pension. Decades of service. Be serious. All right. I will. All humor gone, Wedge fixed Jason with a stare. You're dealing with a coalition government that hasn't settled in place yet. Frack and Sal Solo hasn't been dead very long, and the larvae are still wriggling out from under his rock. We need time to stamp them out. You don't need to hurry. You don't need our answer today, tomorrow, or next week. And any answer you provoke in a short time frame is an answer that will make everyone unhappy. Sit back, be patient, negotiate in good faith, and I have every reason to believe that Corellia will rejoin the G.A. So you'll go back and recommend that Corellia surrender to us? Wedge shook his head. Never in a thousand years. What are you talking about, then? I'll recommend that Corellia rejoin the G.A. Full acceptance of standard G.A. planetary admission terms. 
but no reparations. No punitive measures, no extra tariffs, no under-the-table activity against Corellians, and a genuine attempt to undo the effort to undermine the general Corellian reputation that has been taking place in the GA population. Can you negotiate toward that sort of resolution? I could. But if we suffer any more catastrophes like the bombing on Coruscant, all bets could be off. Understood. Wedge relented just a bit, some of the stiffness leaving his face, his posture. So what are you going to do when the excitement's all done? Stay on with your planetary police force, or go back to wandering the galaxy and rescuing cubs from trees? You used to be pretty good at that. Jason masked a twitch of annoyance by shrugging. Some combination of the Galactic Alliance guard work and resuming my studies, I expect. Hmm. Has the political bug bitten you, then? Or do you just like the way you look in the uniform? Jason sighed, exasperated. Now you're joking again. And I think we've done all we can with this meeting. I think so, too. Serious again, Wedge stood. Jason, may I say something to you not as an officer or negotiator, but as an old friend of the family? Jason rose, too. Something off the record, you mean? Of course. No, no. On the record, off the record. It doesn't matter. As an old friend of the family. Can you listen as an old friend? Still a trifle confused, Jason nodded. Another old friend of mine, Wes Jansen, the galaxy's least serious man, except when he's killing the enemy or trying to make a point, once said this to me. The real sign that someone has become a fanatic, he said, is that he completely loses his sense of humor about some important facet of his life. When humor goes, it means he's lost his perspective. Jason, you've lost your sense of humor about, well, everything. And you're doing things you never would have done when you were younger. What does it mean? Jason shook his head. It doesn't mean that I'm suddenly a fanatic. It just means that I've grown up. I wonder. Ebek is waiting outside. She'll take you back to your shuttle. When Wedge was gone, Jason sat again and stared at the office doors, not seeing them. Blast Wedge, he thought as if losing an adolescent sense of humor has anything to do with fanaticism, as if there was a thought circling around the periphery of his awareness. It was something Captain Levint had sparked into existence, something Wedge had fanned into a live flame, but he couldn't quite bring it into focus. Well, then, he needed to look more closely— Captain Levint thought Jason used to be a hero. Clearly, if such things were measured by numbers of admirers, he was now a greater hero than he ever had been. And yet she thought he no longer constituted one. Why? Because he'd passed judgment on her? Perhaps. Maybe it was because the sentence he'd passed on her was one that would have broken his father's heart or the heart of any smuggler. Perhaps it was because he'd hurt her where she was most vulnerable. It wasn't necessarily a heroic thing to do, he conceded. But it was fair, so let's dismiss that for now. Wedge thought the loss of his sense of humor meant that he'd become a fanatic of some sort. Whether it had or not, Jason had to admit... It did mark a change in him. Both Levent and Wedge had addressed changes Jason had experienced, and that recognition bothered him at some level. For a moment he tried to recapture a sense of what he had been as a teenager, 
before the war against the Yuzhan Vong. Gawky, happy, usually in the company of his twin sister Jaina and younger brother Anakin, all too infrequently in the company of his parents. His sense of humor, always present, had usually manifested itself in the form of awful jokes learned in the four corners of the galaxy. And then there were animals, wedges, cubs in trees. Once upon a time, he'd been able to charm a sand panther into purring, had been able to coax the cub of any species into his hand. How long had it been since he'd done that? Since he'd wanted to do that? Animals. Evil animals. With their razory teeth and their hatred for Jedi. He snapped out of the half-doze into which he'd fallen, but didn't sit up. There was an answer for him. At the height of the Yuzhan Vong War, he, Jaina, Anakin and an elite unit of young Jedi knights had mounted a mission to an enemy world, there to destroy the Voxen, creatures bred by the Yuzhan Vong, creatures that could sense the Force, creatures that had hunted and claimed the lives of numerous Jedi before this mission destroyed them. But Anakin had been fatally wounded on this mission, had died, the children of Han Solo and Leia Organa Solo had suddenly gone from three to two, had suddenly stopped being invincible, invulnerable, immortal. Suddenly there was no room in his life, no room in his universe, for humor. And from that time on animals had all seemed to wear the faces of Voxen. They were no longer his friends. Jason had been captured ending up in the hands of the Yuzhan Vong, ending up under the tutelage of Verger, who was sometimes Jedi, sometimes Sith, sometimes neither. She had taught him much, including how to separate himself from pain or embrace it, how to survive when drowning within the Force or cut off from it, how to be human or Yuzhan Vong or neither. She had taught him to distance himself from everything, should he need to. And now, more than a decade after those events, after her death, he could see another reason why. Only separation offers perspective. All learning benefits from perspective. Therefore all learning benefits from separation which didn't explain why the smugglers' and Wedge's comments had nettled him. You're doing things you never would have done when you were younger, such as firing on the Millennium Falcon. That thought came to him in a rush, like one of Luke's lightsaber attacks, and Jason was unable to parry it, to deflect it, to pretend it hadn't happened. Several days earlier, he had ordered the long-range turbo-lasers of the Anakin Solo to fire upon the Millennium Falcon. I wasn't sure it was the Falcon. Its transponder designation was long shot. You knew. The first voice was his. The second voice was a bit like his, but a whisper. More like Verger's, perhaps. I... knew... It was the Falcon. I knew I was firing on my mother and my father. But I thought they had become enemies. I thought they had betrayed me, Tenel Ka, our daughter. So for that you decided to kill them? No. I knew the Falcon could sustain a turbo laser hit or two. I wasn't trying to kill them. Yes, you were. Jason sighed, defeated by the relentlessness of his own analysis. Yes, I was. I was trying to kill them. Because of what I thought they'd tried to do to Alana. And you were willing to kill Zek, even Ben, even Jaina, to accomplish this. Jason frowned over that. Not kill, precisely. 
he thought. I was willing to sacrifice them, though, for the greater good, for the elimination of two enemies who could have cost you everything, enemies whom you know to be resourceful, relentless. Yes, then it was the right decision. But I was wrong. They turned out not to have been part of the coup attempt. Yes, but it was still the correct decision, based on what you then knew, or thought you knew. Jason nodded. And so you would do it again, if you knew, truly knew, that they were your enemies, that they stood between you and galactic peace, or between you and your daughter. Yes. Good. The tones within his mind were more and more like Verger's. You are still learning. And you are still teaching, even though you're dead. There was no answer, but Jason was calm, satisfied. His decision had been correct flawed only by the incorrect data upon which it had been based. He could do it again if he needed to. And would. He was capable of sacrificing a lesser responsibility for a greater one, a lesser good for a greater one, a lesser love for a greater one. Lumia, his Sith teacher, would be pleased, if she was still alive and he could finally recognize that the boy he had been, the optimistic, joke-spinning, animal-loving, kidnap-prone Jedi boy, was dead, slain on the same mission that had claimed his brother Anakin. At last, understanding what had happened, Jason did not miss his younger self. Finally, he slept. Chapter 3 Coruscant, Galactic Alliance Senate Building, Chief Omis's Office It was a small, private meeting this time. Luke, Mara, Chief Omis, Admiral Neofel, and Kip. Government security men and women waited outside in the reception room, and if Luke knew their type as well as he thought, they'd be fidgety, unhappy about not being on hand to protect the government leaders, in case the Jedi decided to cause trouble. Luke grinned at that. The likelihood of Jedi causing trouble in a situation like this was approximately equal to Cal Omis and Admiral Neothel proclaiming themselves the new Emperor and Empress. Then he sobered. Historically, the last time anything like that had happened, it hadn't gone so well for the Jedi. I understand the demands on your time, Chief Omus was saying. White-haired, earnest, the deliberate embodiment of governmental sympathy and goodwill, he sat opposite Luke, his hands clasped together on the table between them. So I'll be brief. I, representing many voices in the G.A. government, wanted to give you the opportunity— to do a very great favor for that government. Luke nodded. By elevating Jason Solo to the rank of Jedi Master. Chief Omis hesitated. His expression didn't change, but Luke had the distinct impression that the man was taken aback. Luke kept himself from looking at Kip. So Kip's comment earlier was either a secret or a guess— and since Omus isn't suddenly suspicious of Kip, Kip hasn't betrayed a secret. A guess, then. Interesting. Well, yes, Chief Omus conceded. These are unsettled times, Master Skywalker. Colonel Solo is a hero of the people, someone all members of the Galactic Alliance can look toward for leadership. In giving him command of the Galactic Alliance Guard, 
the government has displayed tremendous faith in his abilities and loyalty, and he has demonstrated that he deserves that faith and will continue to earn it. Jason could now also serve as a potent example of cooperation between the secular government and the Jedi Order. If only the Jedi would demonstrate similar faith in him. Chief Omis's voice was as controlled as ever, his manner as persuasive. But through the Force, Luke could sense that the man had no personal investment in this argument. Clearly, he had to be making this proposal at the request of others, perhaps repaying some favor owed to another politician, to one of Jason's patrons. Luke took a quick look at Admiral Neothel, the highest-placed Galactic Alliance politician who was also a keen supporter of Jason. But the Moan Cal was under control, offering no emotions for him to detect. Well, there's a problem. Luke glanced at his fellow Jedi. Mara was stone-faced, offering no expression for the politicians to read. Though Luke could feel through the force link that helped bind them together her irritation with Omis, Kep was slouched back in his chair, smiling faintly, and Luke thought he could detect that Kip was enjoying himself hugely. In my estimation, Jason still lacks the emotional maturity he needs to be a master. Chief Omis gave him a doubtful look. Many Jedi in both the Old Republic and the modern era, became masters at his age or younger. Luke shrugged. It's not a question of age. And, Omis continued, he has demonstrated that he possesses skills and power that not even most confirmed masters can match. Mara sighed and finally leaned in to join the conversation. It's not a matter of power, either. If power were the criterion you think it is, then any eight-year-old with a thermal detonator would be qualified to teach at the university level. Right? Opposite her, Admiral Neothel also leaned in, as if positioning herself like a Moan Cal cruiser to counter the Star Destroyer that Mara represented. She spoke in the gravelly tones common to Moan Calamari. Perhaps power, age, and wisdom are not the only considerations here. Her bulbous eyes whipped around to focus on Mara and then Luke in turn. If Jason is a master of the guard and a master among the Jedi, it blurs the lines between those who have sworn to obey the government and those who merely acknowledge a vague duty and responsibility to the government. A distressing loss of personal authority for the Grand Master of the Jedi Order. Not so. Luke let a little frost creep into his voice. The duty I've acknowledged for forty years is anything but vague. Neothel nodded. Precisely. And so you have nothing to fear. And that's not the issue. Luke gave the Admiral a small frown, a message that her effort to lead the conversation from the realm of logic into the realm of defensiveness would not succeed. Jason is not ready. He's making too many unfortunate choices. He needs guidance and is refusing to seek it. From you. I find that he is very receptive to my guidance. Luke didn't answer. He let the silence between them stretch into long seconds. Finally, Neothel swiveled to look at Kip. Master Duran, I have it on good authority that you advocate elevating Jason Solo to the rank of Master. The purpose for Kip's presence finally clicked for Luke. Months before, at a meeting of the Jedi Council, Kip had proposed elevating Jason to their rank. 
Obviously, word of that had somehow leaked out from those council chambers and reached the ears and tympanic membranes of Omus and Neophil, and Kip had been brought in to reinforce their argument. Kip appeared startled, but Luke detected no genuine emotion of surprise from him. I beg your pardon? Neophil stared at him. You did propose that Jason Solo be elevated. Kip nodded, a little uncertain. In a manner of speaking. Suspicion crept into Neophil's voice. What manner? Kip continued to look uncomfortable. Well, clearly you're unfamiliar with the role of the Terrace Chi in Jedi Council debates. The Terrace Chi? Yes. A sort of ritualized debate opponent. Kip glanced at Luke and Mara as if for confirmation. In certain Jedi traditions, any discussion group or its moderator elects a Terrace Chi— the purpose of the Terrace Chi is to float ideas that run counter to the prevailing wisdom. This is so that all ideas will be tested, sometimes to destruction. The idea that the Terrace Chi promotes is not the one being tested. The idea he promotes tests the idea currently under discussion. It's like a larva that only eats dead flesh. Place it on a wound and it will only devour that which cannot survive anyway. Live flesh, like a solid idea or valid reasoning, will not be harmed by it. Kip thought for a moment. I suppose that the closest equivalence you have in the world of government would be court jesters or the free press. Chief Omus and Admiral Neophil exchanged a look. Omus appeared mildly confused. Neophil's posture suggested she was irritated. Omus cleared his throat. I failed to see the discussion at that meeting, Kip continued, was about Jason Solo's activities and whether they were appropriate for a Jedi. So in the spirit of the Terrace Chi, I not only spoke out in uncritical support of them— I proposed giving him the most lavish reward the Jedi can bestow, as a test of the principal item of discussion. There was now a little chill in the awful's voice. So you're saying that you never supported Jason Solo's elevation? Kip gave her a quizzical look. I support the decisions of the Master of the Order, Admiral. And let me give you a little example of how power and skill with the Jedi arts do not correspond to mastery. When I was still a teenager, I was able to reach into the gravity well of a gas giant and pull a spacecraft out of it. That's something that not many masters could accomplish. I could do it because I was strong in the Force, and because I had absolute faith in my right, my need to use that craft for a specific purpose. But I doubt I could do it today. I'm no weaker in the Force, and I'm a lot more skilled. But today I'd know that my intended purpose was not a good one, and this knowledge would deny me the focus I needed then to perform that task. So was I a master then? Or am I a master now? Chief Omus and Neothel exchanged another look. Omus's face was serene, but it was clear from Neothel's body language that this portion of the meeting had not gone the way she'd wanted it to. Omus tried again, catching Luke's eye. Master Duran's story just goes to reinforce my point. He lacked the experience he needed, experience that would have compelled him to seek the advice of others. But Colonel Solo doesn't lack that experience. He comes to us for guidance. Please, Master Skywalker, 
Don't mistake any anger you might feel that he hasn't consulted enough with you for suspicion about his wisdom and readiness. Luke smiled, suddenly cheerful. All right, I won't. As Neofel straightened, expectant, Luke added, I'll continue to evaluate Jason's progress as a Jedi, and the instant I find him to be ready for the rank of Master, you'll be the first one I inform. Ah. Omus sat back, but maintained a mask of polite cheer. Please do. Luke rose and nodded. Thank you for seeing us. If there's nothing more, I don't want to take up more of your time. No, that was all. There was mock good humor in Omis's voice. Thank you. The Jedi were silent on the walk out of the office, on the turbo lift down to the building's hangar level, and until Kip's speeder carried them out of the Senate building. Mara broke the silence. What is a terrace chi? Kip smiled, showing teeth. A bug in the mines of Kessel, he said. Six legs under a hard round carapace, about three centimeters in diameter. Properly roasted, they only tasted a little awful. When you could catch them, they offered a little nutrition, helped you starve more slowly. Luke looked thoughtful. Thanks for supporting me back there. Why'd you do it? Luke... Kip stopped, shook his head. No. Master Skywalker. I do think Jason should be a master, or I wouldn't have brought up the point at that meeting. But I'm all for showing solidarity. A united Jedi order when this sort of thing happens. When cracks open and politicians get their fingers in them, bad things happen. Empires are formed... Also, I'm more than a little annoyed that they brought up my suggestion from that meeting. How did they find out, anyway? He frowned. Loose talk between masters and apprentices around the temple, probably. Probably, Mara said. But Luke could feel a trace of suspicion growing within her, as it was within him. Even if Kip's opinions had been overheard in the halls of the temple, someone— some Jedi had to have passed them on to the government. Perhaps Jason had done so himself. Luke steered away from that line of thought, and from the even more distressing possibility that it had been Ben who had leaked the information. Chapter 4 Coronet Corellia A bunker always felt like a bunker. Wedge reflected, no matter that this chamber was decorated for entertainment, with wall-mounted displays showing scenes from the city of Coronet and its surroundings in true life colors, no matter that it was furnished with tables supplied with dinnerware suited to formal company and trays of refreshments, with elegantly curved handmade chairs and comfortable immaculate sofas in the most eye-pleasing of styles. It was a bunker, deep beneath the ground, and the men and women who were gathered here, politicians of the world of Corellia, and the drones who worked for them, all sat a little hunched, as though they could feel the tons of masonry and dirt heaped protectively about their heads. Politicians of the other four occupied worlds of the Corellian system, represented by holograms, must have been in above-ground buildings, where they were. Their postures were not bent. Wedge also sat upright both out of habit and to annoy the others, and accepted a cup of calf from one of the drones, this one a pale, slight young man in a Corsac uniform. Wedge waited until the drone had withdrawn, before turning back toward the other man on the couch. So the conversation didn't accomplish much politically, except that I think Colonel Solo will advise in favor of the Galactic Alliance, giving us more time. The man he addressed, Dur Gedjin, the Five Worlds Prime Minister and Corellian Chief of State, handsome, younger than his political acuity might suggest, 
dark-skinned and dark-haired, set his own cup of calf on a nearby table, and frowned. "'Giving us more time,' he echoed. "'That sounds a lot like a victor doing a favor to the vanquished.' "'Obviously they're not victors here,' Wedge said. "'But just as obviously they're in the stronger position. "'A few more weeks or months of their blockade, "'and they'll starve our economy past the point of resistance. "'Solo was right when he said that we were alone.' Unless your communications with the Bothans have had a sudden breakthrough you haven't mentioned. You sound defeated, Admiral. The speaker was the hologram of a short, wide-shouldered man. The transmission of his seated form was superimposed onto a chair to Gedgen's right. The speaker had thinning hair and a face ideally suited to belligerence. His name was Sadris Koyan and he was both Chief of State of the World of Trollis and a member of the Centerpoint Party, the minority force within the Corellian system's new coalition government. Wedge gave him a neutral look. Clearly we're not defeated. But if things continue as they are, we will be. I'm telling you that we can negotiate a non-surrender resolution to this situation— rejoin the Galactic Alliance, and experience minimal repercussions, if we negotiate in good faith, starting now. He felt his mood darken, and knew his expression had to be doing so as well. Good faith may be tricky to come by, though, in a political body that uses its secret reserve fleet to execute a plan to assassinate a foreign head of state. He was drowned out shouted down by the voices of the others. Gedjin was saying, Now is not the time, while Koyan roared, Lack of competence in keeping our access to our own shipyards open. Denjak Stepler, former Five Worlds Prime Minister, now Minister of Justice, grimaced and spoke inaudible words of calm and caution, motioning with both hands for the others to lower their voices. Rorf Willems, Minister of Defense, was grumbling, Bit more cooperation is called for here. Minister of Intelligence Gavel Lamora seemed to be evaluating Wedge, as if measuring him for a coffin. The drones kept conspicuously quiet, while the ministers and chiefs of state raged. Gedjin scowled and spoke again, this time at a full-throated shout. Shut up! The others quieted and stared at the Corellian leader. Gedjin returned his attention to Wedge. Admiral, are you saying that with the assault fleet you could have kept the GA forces out of our system? Kept us from suffering the blockade the GA has instituted? Wedge nodded. It's very likely. Very likely. And you're also saying that our best course of action now— is to negotiate for a no-fault return to the G.A.? Yes. Even though it would inevitably cost us control of Centerpoint Station. The station, home to an ancient gravitic device that could be used to construct entire solar systems, or destroy them, had been near operational when a Jedi mission had sabotaged it, costing the Corellians their most significant weapon. Ben Skywalker son of Wedge's old friend Luke, had been the saboteur. Wedge's association with the Skywalkers was one that everyone present knew. Wedge nodded. Chief Gedgen, that result is far superior to being starved into submission and then forced back into the G.A. under terms dictated by Cal Omas and Admiral Neofel. So we can't win. Not without wealthy, powerful planetary systems joining on our side. Which we were within a centimeter of having, Koyan growled, until Jason Solo and his parents fouled up our action in the Hapes Consortium. Wedge bit down on a response. Assassinating a good ruler such as Queen Mother Tenel Ka so that a treacherous, deceptive, pro-Corellian one could take her place, 
might help win a war, but the peace that followed would be fragile, uncertain, even evil. However, saying such a thing before this body of men and women would do no good. Gedjin, seeming to read Wedge's reply in his expression, looked over at one of his aides. Bring Admiral Delpin in. He returned his attention to Wedge. Admiral Antilles, we have a problem. And the problem is that I don't think you're willing to win at any cost. I'm not, Wedge said. And neither are you. I am, Gedjin said. If winning meant the Corellian system was the only center of civilization to survive the war? Gedjin frowned. That's a ridiculous and extreme example. Exactly. Wedge nodded. But I'll bet that it constitutes an example of a victory you wouldn't be willing to accept. Meaning that you're not willing to win at any cost. We just have to establish for this ruling body what is the maximum consequence in victory that we're willing to accept. Gedjin tried again, demonstrating a level of patience and even respect that Wedge found surprising. Admiral, you were kept out of the loop on the decision to, uh, adjust tape and politics because it was clear to the rest of us based on your history of performance that you would never sign off on it in its final form. You might be right. But we're already in agreement that sacrificing the dictator of a distant government is well within the maximum consequence in victory that we're willing to bring about. The door into the chamber hissed open, and a woman in the dress uniform of an admiral of the Corellian Defense Force the same uniform Wedge wore, entered. She was Wedge's height, and was muscular of build, the sort of woman whose hobby time was probably all spent in a gymnasium. Her hair, cut close, was black, and picked up blue glints from the glow rods around the room. She was about half Wedge's age, and good-looking. There was no trace of makeup evident on her features. There was, however, a trace of sympathy on them as she glanced at Wedge. She came to a stop in front of Gedjin's chair, her cap tucked military-style beneath her left arm. Admiral Jenna Delpin reporting as ordered. Wedge knew her. She was a fast-rising star in the Corellian Armed Forces, and had led the assault fleet in the disastrous coup attempt at the Hapes Consortium. Its defeat had reflected not on her ability, but on factors well outside her control, such as the interference of the Jedi and unexpected armed forces. Gedjin acknowledged her with a nod, then turned again to Wedge. Admiral, what you accomplished in the liberation of Trollis makes it clear that we couldn't have chosen a better leader for our united armed forces. But times change and your personal code of conduct is, I believe, going to become a greater impediment in dealing with your government's needs. Admiral Delpin has a clearer understanding of her role and her duties to the government, and has your skill at moving and motivating subordinates. For this reason, and understand it's nothing personal, we continue to hold you in the highest regard— I'm removing you from the position of Supreme Commander of Corellia's Armed Forces. He turned his attention to the newcomer. Admiral Delpin, I'm appointing you to that position. Thank you, sir. I accept. Her voice was smooth, controlled. Wedge stood. He did it slowly and carefully, the better to mask what he was feeling regardless of how inevitable this moment might have been, regardless of how inflexibly he might hold on to the ethics that had made it happen, being relieved of command still felt like taking a sledgehammer blow to the gut, and he didn't want anyone in this group to see how he felt. Smoothly, he saluted. 
Congratulations, Admiral. She returned his salute. Thank you, Admiral. After this meeting breaks up, perhaps we could have a cup of calf and discuss things. Wedge limited his reaction to a faint smile. He knew what that conversation would consist of. I'm sorry this had to happen. I hope there won't be any uneasiness between us. We need you. No, they didn't. But that realization, and what he had to do next, caused Wedge's stomach to turn even further. Gedgen said, Admiral Antilles, your tactical and strategic planning abilities continue to make you invaluable to our armed forces. If Admiral Delpin agrees, I want you to join her operations staff. Delpin gave Gedgen a crisp nod. I do agree. Wedge took a deep breath. I'm sorry. I can't. Admiral, ordinarily I would have no hesitation in accepting, and in working with you and for you. But circumstances are not ordinary. He fixed Gedgen with a stare. Sir, I hereby resign my commission in the Corellian Defense Force. The room fell silent. A moment later, someone behind Wedge said, Good! Gedgen shot an angry look at the speaker, then addressed Wedge. I won't accept. Wedge shrugged. You have no choice. Or rather, your choice is to keep me on as non-commissioned personnel, or offer me a full discharge. From this point on, or at least from the point I submit my resignation along official lines, I am no longer a commissioned officer. Gedgen heaved a sigh and thought for a moment. You can either stay on as a sergeant, a speeder pilot for our landing forces, or you can make one last public appearance as Admiral Antilles, cheerfully handing off your post and duties to Admiral Delpin, and honorably retire. Wedge considered it. The public appearance would help convince the majority of the populace that everything was fine with their leadership, that he had every faith in the new supreme commander, that he supported the new regime and all its ways, which was a lie. But if he didn't do it, members of the armed forces might lose a little faith in their leadership, and that could result in breakdowns in authority, in the deaths of good soldiers. Wedge's entire deliberation took a quarter second. I'll make the appearance. Of course. Of course, Gedgen echoed. Dismissed. Wedge saluted and, a little stiff-legged, made his way from the room. His posture was perfect for the long walk through the doors, down the long corridor beyond, past a guard station, and into the turbo lift that would carry him up to ground level. But once the lift doors closed behind him, he sagged against the wall. His legs felt like rubber, and his stomach rebelled like a ground pounder's upon its first experience with zero gravity. From Admiral in charge of an entire planetary system's armed forces to civilian in two easy steps, he thought, and managed a slightly nauseated smile. And once again, he might just have signed his own death warrant. A government that was willing to assassinate foreign rulers wouldn't hesitate at ridding itself of someone who could be a potent symbol used against them, and who had just proven that he wasn't with them. The instant he finished his public appearance with Admiral Delpin, the chrono would begin ticking down on his life. The thought, so familiar after a lifetime of warfare, settled his stomach and beat back the nausea he'd felt from the moment he knew he was to be relieved of command. By the time the lift doors opened, he was standing tall again. He walked past the ground-floor security station, 
and flashed its guards a smile, suggesting that he was a rancor, and they were made of meat. Gindine System Tendrondo Refueling and Repair Station The vehicle lining up for an approach on the refueling station's spinward docking bay had once been a Corellian YT-1300 transport, efficiently disc-shaped, with aggressive-looking forward mandibles and a cockpit that protruded from the starboard side of the bow to give the craft an oddly pleasing, asymmetrical profile. Now, however, countless burns of battle damage darkened the hull, and the top and bottom turrets, which had once housed laser cannons, were just gone. As the craft made her last bank before the approach, the man waiting in the docking bay could see that the topside turret had not been replaced or even covered over. Where it had once been installed, there was a hole that gaped into the vehicle's interior. The waiting man would have recognized the Millennium Falcon instantly, even if he hadn't known she would be coming to this place. He had once owned her. He still loved her, and now he winced to see what had become of her. Still urbane and handsome, and now distinguished-looking with age, Lando Calrissian stood in complete contrast with the famous transport. He was dressed in a silken ensemble that would have cost what it took to buy a good speeder, but whose components were all chosen for unobtrusive elegance. The dark blue tunic, black trousers, and purple hip cloak were subdued of color and fashion. The silver-tipped black cane he carried was his one outward concession to age. He watched as the falcon slowly approached. As frail as she looked, he half expected her to bounce off the atmospheric shields that kept the vacuum of space at bay. But she floated gently in through that negligible barrier. Now that the transport was within atmosphere, Lando could hear a rhythmic clanking from within her hull something gone awry within her engine housings. The Falcon slid gently forward on her repulsor lifts and settled down to a remarkably smooth landing. Lando walked around from beneath the mandibles to look through the cockpit viewport, but the occupants had already left, so he continued around to the boarding ramp. He had a handful of jokes in mind for the arrival of Han and Leia, I've seen transports crashed into the sides of world devastators that looked better. What have you done to the old girl this time? Did you buy your pilot's license at the drunken Minoc School of Instruction? But then, as the pair descended the boarding ramp, he caught sight of their faces. There was not one iota of good humor, cheer, even hope in their expressions. Just grimness and, under the surface, pain. Han wore his customary pants, tunic, and vest, and had his left arm in a sling. Leia was in brown Jedi robes. Both sets of clothes looked wrinkled and slept in. Lando cleared his throat to gain a moment to think, and clear away the good-natured, mocking vocal mannerism he had intended to employ. Then he said, I'm glad to see you. I have calf and food in the lounge. While Han and Leia ate, slowly, barely tasting their food, they told Lando what had happened. Jason was the central figure in almost every element of the story. Jason supporting laws to concentrate and imprison Corellians on Coruscant. Jason interrogating a prisoner until she died the daughter of Boba Fett. Jason believing that Han and Leia would conspire against Tenel Ka and punitively firing on the Falcon. When his own parents, sister, and cousin were aboard. Cockmame and Miwal, Leia's Nogri bodyguards, killed in that attack. Not just killed, but incinerated, instantly obliterated, so that there was nothing left to bury. As their account of the events ran down, Lando shook his head, almost unwilling to believe what he was hearing. I'm sorry. I've been up on the holonews. 
I knew about his promotion to head of the Galactic Alliance Guard. But all this... I don't know what to say. Finally, Han looked up from his plate. Can you help us fix the Falcon? Lando nodded. Consider it done. This place is an old repair station I... We picked up in a corporate merger. It's not cost-efficient, so we've transferred most of the personnel to other locations and are going to be closing it down. I'll keep this repair dock open long enough to make the Falcon shipshape. Better than new. He winced again. It'll take some time, though. Han and Leia exchanged a look, and Leia said, We'll need a fast transport for the interim, too. Something that can get us through the Corellian exclusion zone if we need to, and something that doesn't scream, The Solos are back whenever it's noticed. I've got you covered. They were silent for several moments. Then Leia asked, And how are you doing, Lando? I don't want to tell you. That got the attention of both Han and Leia. Why? Han asked. Because it's all good. Leia managed a little smile. I appreciate you not wanting to make us feel worse by gloating. We know that's not what you're going to do. We could use some good news. Really. Oh. Well, then? Lando heaved a sigh. I'd have to say that all my wishes from when I was a young man have pretty much come true. I'm rich, I can travel wherever I want, and do whatever I want. I'm married to a smart, beautiful woman who doesn't worry about where I am every second of the year. I can visit a gambling den and lose a fortune and not catch any heat. Tendra knows that at some point I'll win another fortune, or a patent, or a planet, and make up the loss. Tendrando Arms isn't as big as it was during and right after the Yuzhan Vong War, but it's doing very well selling to security forces in the private sector, and we've diversified. We're very healthy. Leia frowned. You almost sound... sad. Lando paused, groping for the right words. No. But there's no risk in my life. The years aren't going to make me old. But sitting around being successful, popular, and responsible is... He scowled. Do you know how long it's been since a bounty hunter came after me? Leia offered him a wan smile. For us, not so long. Lando heaved himself to his feet. I'm going to show you to your quarters. You get some rest. I'll arrange for a suitable transport to be brought up here. Corellian Exclusion Zone Anakin Solo Jason sat cross-legged in his cabin, floating a meter above the floor. Tranquil. For once, he was fully open to the Force, letting it flow through him, sustain him, support him in the air. He let the Force do as it wished, showing him pictures, flicking little traces of thought and emotion through him. And all the while he searched, peering as if the entirety of the Force were an ocean, and he wanted to find one distant, familiar face among its waves and currents. He found it, very far away, tiny in the distance, but demonstrably still alive. Lumia. And suddenly she was nearer, much nearer. She appeared in his physical vision as well, no more than two meters before him. She looked as though she were a two-dimensional being who had been at right angles to his line of sight, then suddenly rolled over and into plain view. As she had in years past, she wore a dark pants and tunic ensemble, and on her head she wore a wrapped headdress. One portion of it concealed her nose and mouth, 
ending in a sharp point oriented down toward her chest, and two other portions radiated from her forehead as if concealing a Deveronian's horns, giving her head an oddly triangular cast. She lay on her side as if resting on a couch. There was no couch to be seen. She floated in the air as Jason did. Her head was lifted, and her eyes were unfocused. They took a moment to orient on him. Jason! Her voice was distant, echoing as though she were in a large room with hard walls. For a moment he was nonplussed. He'd known about her ability to project realistic force phantoms from her home, an asteroid suffused with concentrated force energy. But he hadn't imagined her using the technique for simple communication. He envied her the technique. Perhaps she would someday show him how she did it. Lumia, he said, I'm happy to know that you've survived. Thank you. She laid her head down again, as if on a pillow. Her movements suggested exhaustion, even pain. I am healing. Here I can summon my strength. Your uncle hurt me. Yet you don't sound angry. She laughed. The noise was faint. I'm used to it. Whenever we meet, I expect him to hurt me. He will probably do so until I die. Or until you and I have won, and he is forced to understand us. I'm in a holding pattern for the moment, Lumia. Waiting for negotiations with the Corellians to bear fruit. Thinking about where my studies need to lead me. Ah. She was silent a long moment. Jason watched her breathe. It seemed to be an effort for her. You have been considering your sacrifice. Sacrificing what you love. Loving what you sacrifice. Yes, I am becoming more ready. Good. And have you been looking for an apprentice? Ben is my apprentice, though I realized not long ago that I can sacrifice him if I have to. Ben is your Jedi, apprentice, not your Sith, apprentice. I'm not a full Sith yet, and therefore cannot have a Sith apprentice. Her sigh sounded exasperated. You're stalling. You don't know whether he will be fit to become a Sith apprentice. The time to learn that is now, not when you reveal yourself. You must test him. He's back with his parents and they don't want him to see me. Lumia lay there, silent, unhelpful. She watched him and waited. So, he considered. I must separate Ben from Luke and Mara and test him. Lumia nodded. If you wish... I will coordinate the test, but you must decide what it will be. All right. And you must decide what to do with him if he fails. Yes. If he fails, will you love him less? Jason paused over his answer. He had to look deep into his own feelings to imagine how he would feel about Ben if the boy failed. I think, initially, it would make little difference. But we would soon grow apart. So if he fails, 
he will not long be suitable as your sacrifice. Keep that in mind. I will. Lumia rolled over again, away from him, and was gone. Chapter 5 Coruscant, the Jedi Temple, Quarters of Luke and Mara Skywalker Luke and Mara kept an apartment away from the Jedi Temple, but also quarters in the temple itself, austere chambers for those times when late-night council meetings or other duties made it more practical to walk a few dozen meters and fall over, rather than board a speeder and fly kilometers to do the same. Sometimes those temple quarters served an additional purpose, such as when the Skywalkers found themselves in command of a surly, defiant Jedi son, who was certain that unfairness was a force power and his parents were its masters. The silence and chill radiating from the boy's room, one door down a common hallway, were formidable. Luke, pacing, was certain he could feel them like air blowing through a wampa's meat locker. He turned in mid-pace to look at his wife. How is it that I feel guilty? Sitting on the bed, Mara looked up from her data pad. You're feeling guilty. We are, because he's unhappy. And he's going to continue being unhappy until we stop slandering and persecuting Jason, the perfect Jedi hero of the people, and male model for black uniforms, or until he grows up enough to revise his thinking about his cousin. She sighed. Do you think we can brick him into his room until he does grow up? Tempting. Luke resumed his pacing. How long did it take you to stop being a headstrong kid who made as many bad decisions as good ones? Luke shrugged in mid-stride. I don't know. From the time Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru were murdered to the time I started calling myself Master. About four years. I'll set the timer, then. It should go off when he's just about to turn eighteen. We can check then and see if he followed your example. That elicited a dry chuckle. All right. We need to figure out what to do with him now. We've got him in the temple where dozens of Jedi eyes can keep an eye on him when we're not around, which is bound to make him more paranoid and angry. What do we do to make him learn? Give him a project, something relevant, such as write a history and analysis of his grandfather's fall to the dark side. Luke stopped again to stare at his wife. That's complex psychology to assign to a thirteen-year-old. Almost fourteen. I'm thinking that if he does his homework, he'll recognize a similarity in the decisions made by Anakin Skywalker and Jason Solo. Luke moved over to sit beside her. That could be helpful. But how do we make sure he does his homework? What do we use to motivate him? Mara took a deep breath. We tell him that if we like his work enough, to submit it to the Jedi Library, we'll let him resume his duties as Jason's apprentice. Luke whistled. Very chancy. Yes, but several things might happen by the time Ben has finished his project to our satisfaction. We might become convinced that Ben can see Jason's flaws, his problems. Jason might recognize his mistakes and become a fit teacher again. Jason might... die. I could feel Jason in the Force a few minutes ago. That's a rare thing these days. He hides from it whenever he wants. And just now he was channeling it, very strongly. I wonder what he's up to. Before Mara could reply, Luke's comlink beeped. He pulled it out and thumbed its switch. Yes? Grandmaster Skywalker, this is Apprentice Siha in the reception hall. The voice was female, young, breathlessly enthusiastic. There is a man here who wishes to see you. He won't see any other master. What's his name and his business with me? 
He says his name is Twinsons Flea. He doesn't have any identification to corroborate that. He says his mission concerns a lightsaber with a silver blade. Luke and Mara exchanged a look. Luke thumbed the comlink microphone off. Twin sins. Twin sons three? Mara nodded. That's what it sounds like. Twin Suns Squadron was an X-Wing unit formed by Luke during the Yuzhan Vong War more than a dozen years before. He had led it for a while, then turned command over to Jaina. It had been decommissioned after the war had ended, but in the years since, Luke had occasionally given the designation temporarily to ad hoc squadrons he'd commanded. Who was Twin Suns Three? Mara continued. At various times... Several different people. Luke thought back to a recorded hologram message he'd viewed only a few days before. A message sent by Han, describing his and Leia's recent encounter on Telker Station. Jag fell, he said. Han said he was back. As for a silver lightsaber, silver blades were rare on lightsabers, and a woman who had once owned one of them had recently been of serious concern to Luke, though her new lightsaber had a different blade color. Ali Marar, Mara said. Right. Luke thumbed the comlink back on. Tell our visitor we'll be right up. Their visitor was only a little over average height, but stood so straight that he seemed much taller. Dressed in a black flight suit, and engulfed by a dark gray traveler's cloak, his face shadowed. He looked more like a forbidding figure from a cautionary children's tale than a peaceable visitor. The darkness of the lofty temple reception hall, with most of its glow rods extinguished because of the late hour and shadows gathering in every corner, reinforced his somber manner. Siha, the receiving apprentice on duty, bowed to Luke and Mara as they entered. She twirled a lock of red hair around nervous fingers. At Luke's gesture, she moved out into the main corridor. Luke and Mara approached the visitor. Luke could read very little from him. No sense of menace, but also not one of friendliness. Perhaps a trace of anger deeply buried. Colonel Fell, Luke said. Jag bowed and offered a little heel click. At your service, he said. He reached up to throw back his cloak hood, revealing the features Luke remembered. His was a lean face with startlingly bright green eyes and a scar leading up from his brow to his hairline. His hair was still dark, a bit longer than the military haircut he had once typically worn, with a mop of it hanging almost into his right eye. Where his scar entered his hairline, one stripe of hair was white. The trim, rakish beard and mustache were new, and gave him an even greater resemblance to his father, the famous Soontir Fell. Luke stepped forward to stretch out a hand. Why the secrecy? You could have visited us officially, with your credentials. There are no credentials. Jag shook Luke's hand, then Mara's when she offered it. I'm no longer a colonel. No longer an ambassador. No longer a citizen of the Chiss. No longer even a member of my father's house. Technically, that suggests I'm no longer even Jagged Fell. I'm as much Twin Sons Three as I am anything else. Ah. Luke considered. Jag wasn't awash in self-pity. Wasn't seeking sympathy with his words. He was just letting Luke in on things the Jedi Master needed to know. And if I understand correctly, your mission here has something to do with Ali Marar. Everything to do with her. Take a walk with us, Mara said. They walked through the halls of the temple, which were mostly dim and little trafficked at this hour, and Jag told the Jedi Masters in unemotional tones of the events of his last few years how, during the Dark Nest missions, he had guaranteed the parole of Lobaka. How Lobaka had violated that parole, 
how the damage done by Lobaka and his Jedi friends had become the responsibility of the Fell family, how Jag had been exiled from that family as a matter of consequence and honor, how Jag had been shot down on the world of Tanoop and had survived there, a lean and dangerous existence for two years, how Alima Rar, mad as a half-crushed bug and carrying within her mind the dual imperatives to recreate the Dark Nest and avenge herself on Luke and Leia, had also survived, also escaped. In those two years, Jag concluded, I gave a lot of thought to Ali Marar, to what she was, what she could do. Afterward, I continued researching her and investigating ways to counter her killic abilities. She can scrub herself from the short-term memory of people, meaning that you can run into her and, if you survive, moments after the encounter, you have no memory of meeting her. It makes her terribly hard to track. Her killic abilities and remaining Jedi powers make her an extreme danger to you and your sister, and to the galaxy. So you've come here to warn me, Luke said. I appreciate that. More than that, I come with gifts. From a tunic in her pocket, Jag drew two items. One was the shape and size of a large cred coin, but silvery and featureless. No portrait of a long-dead hero or deserved-to-be-dead tyrant graced its faces, though a blob of some whitish substance adhered to one side. The other item was a common data card. He handed the card to Mara. This is a graphical interpreter and communications program, he said. It operates in concert with most security holocam programs found in government installations, capital ships, any secure building. Basically, it evaluates every humanoid figure the cam sees, comparing them with a database of Alima Rar's unusual physical characteristics. And when it finds a match, it notifies the security department and sends a coded message to any data repository you specify. If you can get this installed on enough systems, we can perhaps plot her movements, find out her whereabouts before she does any more harm. That may not be as useful as you think, Luke said. Alima probably knows the technique of the Force Flash, a method by which a Jedi can cause interference with holocams, even ones she's unaware of, in order to avoid being recorded. Jag frowned, but he did not seem daunted. This technique, does it make her invisible? Mara shook her head. No, it creates a little static on the recording causes a sort of timing hiccup. That's not so bad, Jag said. Part of the code involves analyzing incidence progression along a sequence of holocams, tracking an identified target. If we extend its analysis to these hiccups and assign a probability that they indicate a single force-using individual, the code could still plot her movements in observed areas. That might be useful in detecting Lumia, too. Mara pocketed the card. Thank you. Also on that card are complete schematics for this, so you can reproduce it. Jag handed the coin-like object to Luke. You use the sticky material to affix this to your neck, or to a shaved spot on your skull. You activate it by saying, Alima. Deactivate it by tapping it twice with a fingernail. He demonstrated, tapping it as it lay in Luke's open hand. From the time it's activated until it's deactivated, it sends electric shocks through your nervous system at one standard minute intervals. Luke grinned. That's helpful. Did you also bring me a brooch that will pinch my skin from time to time? The shock, Jag continued humorlessly, is very precisely attuned to human nervous systems. I haven't had the resources to determine the exact frequency needed by other species. The specific pain generated helps cause whatever is in your short-term memory to be transferred into long-term memory. Ah. Luke looked at the device more closely. Meaning that a lima... The disc began vibrating in his palm. Hastily he tapped it twice, and it ceased vibrating. 
meaning that she can't slip back out of your memory again. That's right. Mara frowned. You know we ought to be able to duplicate that effect with use of the Force. Luke nodded. It's worth researching. I'd prefer a Force technique to going through something like Circus Bantha obedience training. I'll put Master Silgal on it. He tucked the disc into a belt pocket. Fel, thank you. I mean that. Is there anything we can do for you? I... At last, Jag sounded uncertain. I hesitate to ask. Don't, Mara said. I mean, don't hesitate. I don't have anything to do, Jag said, and his voice became curiously hollow. Empty. Except chase Alima Rar until I run her to ground and make sure she can't do any more harm. But I don't have much in the way of resources. No transportation. Little funding. He chuckled. So odd to be living in the private sector. In the military, they give you a mission and whatever resources they can offer. Sometimes too few, sometimes too many. Repeat until you retire or die. Outside the military, everything is so complicated. Luke clapped him on the back. I'll get you resources. Starting with some quarters. No, I have a room. The address and my comm code and frequency are on the data card. I'd prefer not to stay here. All right. I'll go now. I can find my way out. With a final bow to the Jedi Masters, Jag turned... Correctly, Luke noted, despite the many twists and turns their walk had taken them through, toward the temple's main entrance, and strode away, pulling his hood up as he walked. Mara watched him go and shook her head. That's a man with not enough to live for. He'll bounce back, Luke said. He's young. He fingered the device Jag had given him. Come on. Let's see if Silgal is still up. Returning to the temple from a late errand, Jaina passed the lone Jedi performing guard duty at the building's wide-open main entrance and walked into the main corridor. Just leaving was a man wrapped up in a dark cloak. He kept to the left side of the corridor, away from her, not even appearing to notice her. She hesitated as they came abreast of each other, his upright posture, military bearing, and the unconscious arrogance of his stride causing bells to sound in her memory. When he was one step past her, she stopped and turned her head to look at him. Jag? He stopped, too, but did not turn. His face remained completely hidden within the folds of his hood. But it was Jag Fell's voice that answered, Yes? Were you just going to walk past? Not even say hello? Yes. And then he was gone, swallowed up by the Coruscant night beyond the doors. Gindine System, Tendrondo Refueling and Repair Station Hands on hips, Han stood in the lounge of the vehicle now parked alongside the Millennium Falcon. You have got to be kidding. If you'll forgive me, Captain Solo, C-3PO said, Master Calrissian's vocal mannerisms, though laced with humor, do not suggest that his basic thesis was in jest. Han glared at the gold-toned protocol droid, then returned his attention to his surroundings. The lounge was, if not a thing of beauty, a testimonial to obsessive detail. The walls and ceiling were covered by thick, velvety material in a dark blue that matched the deep carpet on the floor. Silver glow-rod housings, polished to a dazzling level of reflectivity, protruded at tasteful intervals from the walls and ceilings. Furniture included four comfort couches, each with ceiling-mounted semi-transparent privacy curtains that would glide into position or retract at the touch of a button. Controls for the couch's temperature and vibration settings were mounted on silver panels inset in the velvet walls. Hanging chairs of woven plant stock 
plated in a silvery surface, were suspended from the ceiling. Gleaming tables stood nearby to bear the weight of platters of food, and a water fountain reproducing in miniature form a famous waterfall from the world of Naboo burbled in the center of the chamber. Leia, beside Han, nodded. It's even more crass than the Lady Luck. Lando, facing them from across the room to view their first reactions to the pleasure pit, smirked. She's a bit like the lady. An older model. A Soro Sub-2400 yacht. Her owner, her former owner, fell on hard times, and they got harder when he decided to win back his fortunes in a sabac match I was sitting in on. He shrugged. We had a lot in common, including taste in luxury yachts, but not including the fact that he drinks while gambling. I won his craft and a year's contract for his services as a salesman. He's marketing my droids in the Outer Rim now, and conveniently, the yacht is still officially registered in his name, since I somehow haven't found time to file the change of ownership documentation. What's her name? Leia asked. Lando modulated his voice to its richest, most seductive tones. The Love Commander. He stretched out the word love, an exercise in mockery. Leia looked at him as though he could not possibly be telling the truth. At his confirming nod, she put her hands over her mouth, the better to restrain any laughter that might emerge. Han shook his head. I don't want to say what I think of her as a vehicle, but as a disguise, she's perfect. He pulled his left arm from its sling and flexed his hand experimentally. Several weeks' worth of medical treatments since he sustained the injury and a good night's sleep had improved his condition somewhat, and his manner suggested he would soon be his old fighting self. Let's move our gear from the Falcon to the Master Cabin, he told Leia. Lando shook his head. No, you're in the biggest of the guest cabins. I'm in the master cabin. They both looked at him. You're coming along? Leia asked. After due consideration, it seems to me that you'll be a lot more anonymous as my pilot and navigator. Me being Beskat Ofterman, hollow entertainment mogul and pleasure seeker of the corporate sector rather than the faces the authorities see whenever they establish communications with the love commander. Right? Well, Leia considered, that's true. But I don't look forward to Tendra tracking us down and killing us if we get you hurt. She'll be glad to get me out of the home for a while. She knows how twitchy I've been lately. Lando picked up his cane and twirled it theatrically. Come on, nameless crew. Let's get to it. Han clapped C-3PO on his metal shoulder. Goldenrod, you get the most important mission of all. You stay here and record every single thing they do to the Falcon during repairs. And try not to talk to them while you're doing it. Oh, dear. An hour later, personal possessions moved aboard and pre-flight checklists completed, Han, sitting at the navigator's console, was a bit more favorably disposed toward the love commander. Despite the yacht's name and pleasure-oriented mission, despite her swirly, mood-altering sky-blue and green exterior paint job, the vehicle wasn't a bad choice for their current needs. At fifty meters, she was nearly twice the length of the Falcon, but didn't mass much more, having a long, sleek design with two outrigger propulsion pods, one on either side, each carrying sublight ion drive and hyperdrive components. The hyperdrives were nothing special, but the ion drives had been rebuilt and overbuilt, giving the yacht considerable speed in sublight situations. 
nor was she unarmed, though at first glance it had appeared she was. A pop-up turret, hidden beneath an artfully concealed access plate on the top hull, held a turbo laser. At the bow beneath the bridge was a concussion missile port, hidden behind a false dish in a sensor array. And the yacht did have shields, though the shield generator, appearing to be an auxiliary hatch, lay folded down against the top hull when not in use, and would take a few seconds to raise into position and become active. Now, with Leia in the pilot seat, at Lando's insistence, since Han was not yet fully healed, and Lando in the oversized, preposterously comfortable captain's chair at the rear of the command cabin, the love commander lifted ponderously from her berth, backed on repulsor lifts away from the Falcon, and slid stern first into vacuum. Where to, navigator? Lando asked, activating his chair's massage vibration. Some place interesting, I hope. Should be interesting enough. Han finished putting their course into the nav computer. Corellia, we're going to zip through the exclusion zone laughing at the Alliance picket vehicles trying to blow us up. Then we're going to drop down to the planet's surface, determine whether Prime Minister Dirk Gedgen was acting alone when he ordered the hit on Tenel Ka, which probably means beating a confession out of him, and then deciding whether to forgive him or kidnap him and his co-conspirators and bring them to justice. Oh, Lando asked. What do we do on day two? Despite himself, Han snorted, amused. We'll figure something out. Well, wake me when we get there, whatever your name is. Empty Space Engine Compartment of the Duracrud Captain Urin Levint lay on the grimy Durasteel deck, half propped up against an almost equally grimy wall, and waited to die. Her tools lay scattered on the deck, along with the deck plates she had pulled up, plates that gave her access to the various components of Duracrud's hyperdrive. The only sounds to be heard were her own breathing and the distant rhythmic noises made by the ship's life support system. There were no lights on in the ship except here. Mechanics glow rods magnetically clamped to offer light to the hyperdrive compartment, and on the bridge, where status lights should still be winking in their various colors. Levint knew it would take her a long time to die. The Duracrud would continue to provide breathable air for weeks. The stores of food and water would run out first, in a few days. She'd have plenty of time to record and transmit a few final messages— one would denounce Jason Solo for his treachery. One would confirm that her will, on file with an advocate's office on remote Tatooine, did accurately record her final wishes. She might even record a final speech, something to put her life into perspective. Then she'd die of thirst. Or, if she chose to end her suffering faster, she could shoot herself or step out an airlock. But one thing she could be sure of, given the remote, untraveled nature of the spot she'd chosen for her first hyperspace jump, no cargo vessel or fast-moving courier would ever chance upon her, and her last transmissions, traveling at the speed of light, would take eight years to reach the nearest star. She was as alone and doomed as anyone in the universe could be. Delicious, isn't it? The voice was female, and came from outside the meager light provided by Levint's glow rods. Levint jerked upright. She grabbed for her blaster, then remembered it was with her holster belt in her cabin. She'd left it there when collecting her tools. Who's there? Your suffering, we mean, the voice continued. You suffer like a child who cries herself to sleep each night, knowing that her parents will never, ever understand. How long has it been since you were that child? Levint rose on shaky legs and began to edge her way back to the door out of this compartment. 
at the door, she could turn on the overhead glow rods and see who was tormenting her. But she almost didn't want to turn on those lights. What if there was no one in the compartment with her? What if recognition of her fate had driven her crazy, and she was doomed to spend her last few days hearing voices? As if reading her mind, the voice in the darkness laughed. Levint reached the doorway, found the light control by touch, and activated it. The overheads came on, bright, blinding her. And then, as her eyes adjusted, she saw her visitor. And she knew she was not crazy, because her accumulated experiences and neuroses would never concoct a being like the one she saw. Her visitor was a blue Twi'lek woman of no unusual size. She was dressed in a dark traveler's robe and black clothes. Her features were pretty, but she had obviously been the victim of catastrophe at some point in her life. Her left shoulder was lower than her right, with her left arm hanging in such a way that Levint suspected it was non-functional, and her right head tail had been severed at about the halfway point. And now, as she stepped forward, she limped. This was no monster in the night, or phantom of the imagination. Levint stared, incredulous. Who are you? We are Alima. Alima? And what are you doing here? We are a stowaway. Levint stared at Alima for a few moments more, and then it happened. The laugh came bubbling up out of her like a high-pressure Santa spray stream. The laugh became a painful howl. It shook her, and it kept coming. Dizzied, Levint bent over to rest her hands on her knees and rested her backside against the bulkhead. Otherwise, she would have fallen. Finally, her laughter trailed away, leaving her throat hoarse, her body weary. Alima's expression did not change, except to become slightly curious. Why do you laugh? Because you're the worst stowaway in the galaxy. In history. Levint straightened. Because you picked the worst possible ship to stow away on. The hero of the Galactic Alliance sabotaged my hyperdrive. We know this. We watched his agents do it. That snapped Levint out of her manic mood. You watched it? Yes. And got on board anyway? Yes. Alima smiled. No, we do not wish to die. We stowed away after making sure of what the agents had done, and after acquiring the parts needed to repair the drive. Levint took an involuntary step forward. You can fix it? Yes, though we will only fix it if you are dead. But if you and we come to terms, you will live, and you will repair the drive. Levint had to parse that statement. Alima's use of we to refer to herself caused her sentences to jump through flaming hoops like a carnival bantha. You mean, if we come to terms, I make the repairs, and we both get out of here. If we don't come to terms, you presumably kill me, and then you make the repairs and you get out of here. Alima's smile broadened. Good. Yes. What are your terms? You help us find the parents of that hero of the Galactic Empire. You act as a public face for us in that search. You do not reveal our presence to the authorities. You do not attack or unnecessarily endanger us. You are one of the smugglers, yes? You use your knowledge of smuggling to help in this search. She furrowed her brow for a moment, then relaxed. You treat us as an esteemed paying passenger. 
And once you've found the solos, you will have fulfilled your obligation. Levint considered her options. She'd always admired Han Solo, and this woman's obvious need to stay out of public sight didn't argue well for what her intentions were when she found him. Levint could ask, but then she'd have to decide whether she was willing to object and ruin this deal, if Falima's intentions were hostile. Well, if they were, she could admire Han Solo as a unique piece of galactic history. I agree. Good. We will find the replacement components where we have hidden them. We will even hand them to you as you effect repairs. Much obliged. Chapter 6 Coronet Corellia The crowd seated in the assembly hall, mostly Holonews professionals, applauded, but more courteously than enthusiastically. That was all right, Wedge decided. He wasn't here to be validated. He just wanted brevity. With a glance at Prime Minister Der Gedgen to his left and Admiral Delpin to his right, Wedge leaned in over the lectern to conclude his speech. The reorganization of any military force works best if it synthesizes mature experience with youthful innovation, mature patience with youthful energy. I like to think that in this time of crisis, I've been able to provide the experience and patience and I have every confidence that Admiral Delpin offers the innovation and energy to finish the job. Corellia's armed forces are in good hands. He stepped back as the questions started. Gedgen took his place. Admiral Antilles and I will be taking our leave of you, but Admiral Delpin will be making some introductory remarks and then taking questions. Thank you. He nodded to Wedge, and together the two of them made their way to the end of the stage and the comparative privacy it offered. The applause increased, and out of the corner of his eye, Wedge saw a few of the news professionals rise to their feet for him. Then he and Gedgen were in the darker, cooler backstage area. Not that Wedge could relax. Not yet. Gedgen gave him a close look. You're sweating. Hot under those lights. They passed through the doors leading out of the backstage area. The corsac guards waiting there, Gedgen's bodyguards, a tiny uniformed woman who moved like a dancer and a YVH battle droid, fell in step behind them. So what will you do now that you're a civilian again? Gedgen asked. Get assassinated, Wedge thought. Maybe you personally won't have anything to do with it, even in thought or intent, but someone in your government will. Back to my memoirs. Maybe give my daughter some flying lessons. That's Miri, correct? Congratulations on her recent graduation. I understand Corellian Intelligence has made her an employment offer. Wedge nodded. So has the Galactic Alliance Intelligence Service a bit more covertly. Gedgen almost missed a step as he walked. He looked sharply at Wedge. You're joking. Of course I'm not. The Alliance risks an undercover contact in Coronet to try to recruit my daughter as a double agent. I'm a proud father. Gedgen's suspicious look didn't waver, so he added, Oh, don't worry. She didn't take the offer. And she reported everything she knew about that recruiter to Corsac, I assume. Of course not. Her mother and the Institute taught her too well for that. That recruiter now falls into the category of one of her personal set of contacts. Maybe she'll choose to suborn him, or use him for some other purpose. Gedgen shook his head. I really prefer to think that you're just kidding me. Wedge nodded, affable. You do that. He came to a stop beside a door leading into a refresher. I need to make a quick stop. 
I'll catch up with you later. Don't forget the dinner three nights from now. I won't. Gedjin and his bodyguards continued on their way. Wedge ducked into the refresher. That dinner, a testimonial affair arranged to celebrate his retirement, was one piece of evidence pointing to the unlikelihood of an assassination attempt occurring today. Public appearances were the events where it would be easiest to eliminate him, and he had only two scheduled, today's Hollow News conference and the dinner. Nothing had happened at the conference, so the dinner became the next most likely opportunity. But as Iella had pointed out, the story was just too good, too fulfilling to the public if he were to die today. Minutes after stepping down from his position as military supreme commander of Corellia, Wedge Antilles was cut down by an alliance assassin. The viewing audiences would sympathize and say, of course, and Wedge's life would fall into a neat little pile of perspective for them. Once in the refresher, Wedge took a quick look around, making sure that no one waited in any of the stalls or the Sanistine unit at the end. He peered out the door again, assuring himself that the only beings in sight were Gedjin and party, now meters away and continuing toward the building's exterior doors. From under his tunic, Wedge pulled a government-printed sign that read, Facilities Under Repair. He pressed it to the front of the door, to which it adhered. Then he shut and locked the door. His package was waiting for him where it was supposed to be, affixed out of sight under the sink. He pulled the anonymous gray bag free and opened it on the sink counter. Inside were a change of clothing, lightweight black pants, shirt, shoes, cap, belt, and a jacket decorated on its back with a view of Centerpoint Station. The long, lumpy, unlovely space station was now a rallying symbol for Corellians, and there were hundreds of thousands of jackets just like this one being worn on the streets. Wrapped up in the clothes were a sun visor to conceal his eyes and a DH-17 blaster pistol, scoped, the precise pattern of venting on its barrel indicating that it was not of recent manufacture. But its gleaming black surface suggested that it had been meticulously maintained or recently restored. Wedge didn't care for the DH-17 as much as some other models. The grip angle prevented it from being a natural pointer for him. But it was a good weapon, and Iello was sure to have found one that could not be traced back to the Antilles family. Hastily he shed his white admiral's uniform, tossing it into the Sanistine stall, and dressed in the garments from the bag. He put the DH-17 into the right-hand jacket pocket, and kept his holdout blaster, a smaller, less powerful weapon, in its little holster at the base of his spine. Finally he looked at himself in the mirror. Staring back at him was Wedge Antilles in a center-point jacket and a visor over his eyes. He sighed. Disguise never had been his strong suit. But at least someone fixated on looking for a man in an admiral's uniform might miss him. Two minutes later, he exited a side door of the government building, well away from the public front exit and the rear access that were the most likely points for his departure, and merged instantly with pedestrian traffic. At the same time, he gave his comlink a click. There was an immediate reply of two clicks, Iella letting him know that she saw him. He had proceeded about a hundred meters down the walkway. As speeder traffic hurtled by to his left, he'd counted ninety-eight steps, when he heard three clicks on his comlink. Iella reporting that he was being tailed. Wedge swore. This wasn't going to be a clean departure then. He put his hands in his jacket pockets, gripping the blaster with his right. Ahead, one street up, was the speeder hangar building where Iella had left the airspeeder that was to be his departure vehicle. It was, in fact, a vehicle belonging to the Corellian government, to the fleet of speeders used by minor functionaries. The day before, Iella had stolen it and put it in place on the building's fourth floor. As he approached the street corner, Wedge weighed his options. 
The obvious one was to continue ahead, down into the depressed, plastrite-lined pedestrian underpass. But that would put him in a straight tunnel about 20 meters long, with nowhere to duck if enemies entered behind him and began shooting. Beside him, speeders occasionally slowed to allow passengers to board or depart. He could jump into one of those vehicles, commandeer it, make a run for it, but that wasn't inconspicuous, and he was likely to be identified. He could break into a run, see if that flushed out his pursuers, so that Iella could deal with them. His decision was forced on him. His comlink crackled with Iella's voice, her cry of, Down! He dived for the sidewalk, hit it hard, felt the air above his back heat up. Ahead, a speeder making a right turn onto the cross street between Wedge and the parking hangar took a blaster bolt, a blaster rifle bolt in the starboard side. That plasteel panel and the transparasteel viewport above it blackened and bowed in, and a moment later the speeder was lost to sight, hidden behind the building Wedge had departed mere moments ago. Wedge rolled over toward the street to his left, freeing the blaster pistol from his pocket before he was completely on his back. He took quick note of the orange airspeeder now heading his way from a prescribed altitude above the normal traffic flow, realized that, from the angle of the shot meant for him, the speeder couldn't have been its source, and kept rolling, inverting as he did so, leaving him facing back the way he'd come, as he rolled out into the traffic lane. That wasn't as dangerous as it would have been had the traffic included ground vehicles. For the moment, it was all speeders, and the ones headed his way swerved or gained a little altitude as their pilots realized there was a man sprawled in the road. They didn't swerve or climb particularly well. Three ran over him in the space of a second, but only their repulsor lift pulses hit him pushing him harder into the roadway duracrete, and in passing over him they provided a little cover from the oncoming airspeeder, giving him time to look for— There they were on the sidewalk, two men in traveler's robes. Jedi robes? One carried a blaster rifle. The other, a silvery tube, Wedge thought had to be an unlit lightsaber. There were no pedestrians between their position and Wedge's, no shock there, as they had obviously waited for the walkway to clear before firing. He returned fire, squeezing the trigger as fast as he could, using each bolt's passage through the air to show him how to traverse. He knew the Jedi attacker would ignite his lightsaber and bat the bolts out of the air, but perhaps his wild spray of fire would cause the sniper to panic. It didn't work out quite that way. Both men dived for the ground. Wedge's shots still hit the Jedi in the groin, and then the face. That man twitched and then lay still, scorched and smoking. The sniper resumed aiming, and Wedge resumed rolling, moving farther out into the traffic lanes, banging knees and elbows with every revolution, being hammered by the repulsors of each speeder that passed directly over him. His ears rang from the impacts. A man dressed in an eye-hurting green jumpsuit fell out of the sky and landed beside the sniper. He was broad-shouldered, not tall, and had a bushy red beard that fell nearly to his waist. Even at this distance, something about him shouted disguise to Wedge. The sniper looked up at the man from the sky, losing his fix on Wedge. Wedge glanced up for a moment. The airspeeder that had been heading his way was now moving from a position directly over the sniper, and back toward the traffic lane, back toward Wedge. The bearded man had to have come from it, and had to have dropped four stories to land beside the sniper. The red-bearded man kicked the sniper full in the face. The force of the blow snapped the man's head back, and sent him skidding for a meter across the sidewalk. Wedge's comlink crackled again with Iella's voice. Are you all right? Yes, oof. Bumpy. Wedge scrambled farther to his right, ending up in the gap between two traffic lanes moving in opposite directions. The awful orange speeder is your new ride. 
I'll retrieve the one I dropped off. Understood. Love you. Love you. The orange speeder did a complete barrel roll as it roared over two lanes of traffic, then dropped precipitously into the gap where Wedge stood. He forced himself not to flinch as it came to a stop, its bow only a meter from him. The pilot was a woman in her early twenties. Her eyes were hidden behind dark goggles, and her hair was a riot of colors, every lock seemingly a different hue. She pointed a gloved finger at him, as if aiming a blaster pistol. Hi, Dad! Wedge scrambled across the speeder's bow and over its windscreen, dropping into the front passenger's seat. Miri, I thought you were supposed to stay at home, keep it secure. Plans change. Are you mad? Spelled ungrateful? No. Let's go. Just a second. We're waiting for— The speeder rocked and sank almost to ground level from the impact of something landing in the back seat. Wedge spun, saw a flash of awful green jumpsuit and red beard, and kept himself from swinging his pistol fully into line. Then he caught sight of the eyes behind that preposterous red beard. Corin. Corellia's resident Jedi Master grinned at him. Miri hit the thrusters, and Wedge was shoved by acceleration into his seat back, toward Corin. He continued, So Iella's message got to Mirax. Corin nodded. And my wife got the message to me, and I got to your quarters in time for Miri to get me here. Everybody got something. Hey, girl, keep it down to fifty meters or lower. Miri waved at him, cheerfully ignoring his advice as she climbed to near rooftop level. But then her ballistic course reached its apex, and she began a stomach-twisting dive toward a traffic lane a few blocks away. Sorry it was such a mess, Wedge said. I really thought the disguise and side-door gambit would throw off pursuit. It did, Miri said. Mom says the main hit teams were assembled front and back. We missed about three-quarters of the assassins this way. Oh, good. Please tell me that all that stuff will wash out of your hair. It will, but the tattoos are permanent. Tattoos? Miri laughed at him. Coruscant, Jedi Temple Vehicle Hangar It wasn't a large number of starfighters, less than a full squadron's worth, nine X-wings, one E-wing, but they were all beautifully maintained, and Jag Fell felt an unexpected pang as he looked at them. It seemed so long ago that flying craft like these had been his whole life. He missed that. He missed belonging to a band of comrades, divided by individual needs and peculiarities and prejudices, but united in their goals and their support for one another. He let none of what he was feeling reach his face. The Jedi Order would like to fund and support your mission, Luke Skywalker was saying. That snapped Jag's attention back to the present. To find and destroy Ali Marar, he said. To find and neutralize Ali Marar, Luke corrected. Yes, obviously it might entail killing her. But should an opportunity arise to capture her, transport her back here so that she might be convinced to see the error of her ways— Jag let just a hint of mockery enter his voice. No, so that she might find her own path to redemption. Jag considered. Dealing with the Jedi would always be like this, he decided. The military made plans based on objectives, such as find and eliminate an enemy force. The Jedi didn't so much make plans as choose directions such as make things better. Back in the days of the Yuzhan Vong War, the two different approaches had been a bit closer to each other. In these less defined times, the basic incompatibilities were more obvious, so he would have to adjust his thinking a bit if he was to work with the Jedi. But he was a bit unsettled 
to realize that he wasn't sure the Jedi approach was the wrong one. Even with Ali Marar. Once he, Jag, had known a Jedi girl who had stepped off the right path, gone the wrong way for a while. She had found her own way back soon enough. But what if she hadn't? If she had continued, might she not be a bit like Ali Marar? And would Jag be just as sanguine about hunting her down and killing her? I accept, he said. Good. I'm actually heading up a similar unit, pursuing leads involving the Sith Lady Lumia. She may be dead now, or maybe not. But what's clear is that she was in alliance with Alima as of a few days ago, when they ambushed me and Mara. Now that it's clear that Lumia was, or is, employing agents, and who some of them are, we stand an improved chance of finding her trail. I don't know much about her. I assume the term Sith Lady doesn't bode well. Not well at all. I'll get you the basic information on her. Luke reached into a pocket and handed items over to Jag. Identicard. It identifies you as Jagged Fell, a civilian specialist employed by the Jedi Order. The second one's a cred card. It gives you access to a drawing account set up for your task force. The third is a security card with what you need to assume control of. He pointed. That X-Wing. Sorry I can't provide you with a Chiss Clawcraft. That's all right. I'm fond of X-Wings as well. I also want to assign a couple of Jedi to you. You're hunting a dark Jedi. You'll benefit from having Jedi with you. I agree. Luke glanced toward a door leading into the hangar. Speaking of which, he must have been alerted by an impulse in the Force. For when Jag followed his glance, the door was shut. But now it slid up and open and a woman in brown Jedi robes walked into the hangar. Uncle Luke, you wanted to see... Oh. Jag refrained from stiffening. It was Jaina Solo. His mind clicked through a number of possibilities and arrived at one inescapable conclusion. That she was going to be... I'm putting together a small task force to find Ali Marar, Luke said, Colonel Fell here is in charge. I'm assigning you to it. And Zek when he's fit to fly. Jaina came to a stop a few meters away, looking between the two men as if still expecting the punchline to a joke that already wasn't funny. That is not a good idea. I don't think I can operate as this man's subordinate. Luke gave her a quizzical look. Back in the Yuzhan Vong War... Though he outranked you, he didn't offer you any grief about being your subordinate. Things are different now. Luke nodded. Yes. You're both older and wiser. And on top of that, the two of you have worked together before, know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and have complementary skills. Consider it settled. He glanced between them. I'll leave you two to get caught up. Jag, please get me a plan of operation at your earliest opportunity. He turned and headed toward the door. Jag waited until Luke was out of hearing. The problem with Jedi Masters, he said, is that they can't be beaten with impunity. Jaina looked at him, suspicious. Jag, did you just make a joke? No. He clamped down on the anger rising within him. He knows why I wouldn't want to work with you, and has decided to disregard my wishes. I'll have to assume that his reasoning is sound, whatever it is, until proven otherwise. All right, let's do some strategic planning. Why wouldn't you want to? Jaina was clearly confused, and so far as Jag could tell, possibly hurt as well. Because of what happened with the Dark Nest? It doesn't matter. 
We have planning to do. He gestured toward the door. She stood her ground, glaring. It does matter. If I'm going to be working in a hostile environment, I need to know why. If we have a problem, you should have told me about it years ago. I couldn't. The words, heated, snapped out of him. I was stranded on Tanoop for two years. And because of your actions, ignoring the consequences of freeing Lobaka and what he did subsequently, I am now barred from my family forever. And that is the why. She gaped. The anger didn't leave her face, but something in it changed. Jag supposed that she was offended either by his blaming her or by the fact that he had been punished for the action of others. Yes, he added, the Jedi way preaches forgiveness. But that isn't the Chiss approach. To the Chiss and my family, I am an unperson. And that's forever. Don't bother thinking about ways to correct the situation. It would be roughly as useful as worrying about painting out the laser damage your uncle left on the hull of the Death Star. Instead, worry about Alima Rar. Finally, her mouth closed. It took her a few moments, but military discipline reasserted itself. All right. Strategic planning. At his gesture she preceded him to the door back into the temple hallways. Corellian Exclusion Zone Love Commander I feel, Lando announced, like an idiot. He studied himself in the main display screen serving the captain's chair on the Love Commander control cabin. Mounted on a swing-out arm so that it could be positioned directly before him or moved out of the way, it was now beside his chair and switched off. Reflective when not active, it showed him in his new guise, wearing a white beard and mustache, and a white wig with hair so long that the braid swinging from it would reach to his thighs when he stood. But you look magnificent, Leia said. Oh, I know that. Not even the wig could downgrade me to just startlingly handsome. Shrugging, Lando swung the display screen completely out of the way. He affixed Han with a stern stare. Navigator, our heading? Han returned his glare. He'd had to go to a greater extreme to disguise himself. Without a beard, he looked like Han Solo. With one, he looked like his cousin, Thracken Sal Solo, the late Corellian president. So more significant efforts were called for. He'd sprayed all exposed areas of skin with a cosmetics compound that turned him a yellowish hue, and the spiky black halves of his false mustache, had they continued up to his nose, would have made a perfect chevron. Same as it was five minutes ago, Captain, he said. Straight toward Corellia, straight from Coruscant along the most heavily patrolled corridor through the exclusion zone. Good. Good. Lando nodded benignly. I'm glad you haven't managed to foul up in five minutes. Han flexed his shoulder experimentally. He was recovered enough not to need the sling at most times, but still not in shape to handle piloting in extreme situations. When I'm better... I'm going to throttle you. Good, good. Leia smiled and turned back to her control board. She was the least dramatic looking of the three. Dressed in a dumpy brown jumpsuit, padded here and there to make her less visually interesting to male observers, wearing makeup that diminished her beauty rather than enhancing it, her hair in a nondescript style and tucked up into her cap, she was unexceptional in every way. Then, as her attention fell on the sensor screen, her eyes brightened. We have an incoming blip. No telemetry yet, except that it's bigger than a starfighter, smaller than a capital ship. Good, good. Stop saying that, Han muttered. Here we go. Leia patched the comm board through the overhead speakers. Incoming craft, this is Spinnerfish, Galactic Alliance Second Fleet. 
Cut your sublight engines and identify yourself immediately. The voice was male, curt, an alto trying to force itself into the range of a baritone. At Lando's nod, Leia killed the ion thrusters. Lando swung out his display screen again and activated it. Before him was the image of a young man, crisply attired in an Alliance Fleet lieutenant's uniform. He was clean-shaven, his face angular, his manner stern, official. Behind him were cockpit chairs arranged in a configuration Lando recognized. Armed shuttle, he told himself. Don't we rate at least a Corvette? But he put on his friendliest smile and modulated his voice into its richest tones. Hello, I'm Beskat Ofterman, master of the private yacht Love Commander. What's a spinnerfish? The lieutenant opened his mouth as if to answer, looked confused for just a fraction of a second, and thought better about responding. Love Commander, you are entering restricted space. You have to turn around and depart the Corellian system. Oh, no, son. I'm here for at least a month. I'm here to gamble. Gamble? Sir, what's your planet of origin? That would be Coruscant. Then you have to be aware that the Galactic Alliance and the Corellian system are currently in a state of war. You don't say. What has that got to do with gambling? It means you can't visit. Son, I don't see that gambling has anything to do with anything. My gambling in Corellia won't alter the course of the war one millimeter. I mean, it's not as though I had a bunch of smuggling compartments filled with Bacta, or offers of aid from Commonor, is it? The lieutenant's mouth worked for a moment. Then he said, Love, Commander, prepare to be boarded and inspected. Lando smiled agreeably. Now that's the kind of thing I like to hear. Decisiveness. Crew, activate the top airlock and prepare to be boarded. The lieutenant and two security officers came aboard. Han took the security men on a tour of the yacht while the lieutenant came to the control cabin, his data pad in hand and questions on his mind. He sat in the navigator's seat while Leia pretended to ignore him. Captain Ofterman, do you know what the penalties are for offering aid and comfort to the enemy in a time of war? I imagine they're pretty harsh, Lando said. Good thing we're not doing that. Good thing we're not doing that, Leia quietly echoed, making a small gesture with two outstretched fingers. So it's a good thing you're not doing that, the lieutenant said. He checked an item off on his data pad. No, Lando continued. What we're actually doing is something else, something vital to the Alliance's war effort. Vital, Leia said. The lieutenant nodded, earnest, interested. Vital. So we have to get to Corellia. So we have to get to Corellia. Well, you obviously have to get to Corellia, then. Lando shrugged. But how? The lieutenant thought about it. Well, it's a pity you don't have any of the access codes provided by intelligence— that would allow you to fly right in. Oh, that would be handy. Lando fixed the lieutenant with what he hoped was an honest look. Do you have a lot of those recorded on your shuttle, son? The lieutenant laughed. I can't tell you, sir. Of course you can, Leia said. Of course I do. Why don't you just give us one, then? Why don't you just give us one, then? The lieutenant nodded. That would solve everyone's problem, wouldn't it? Lando smiled. It sure would. The lieutenant rose. 
I can't just transmit that sort of information. I'll go download it from our bridge computer and give you a data chip. How does that sound? Sounds wonderful. I'll be right back. When he was gone, Lando looked at Leia. That wasn't really fair, was it? She shook her head, smiling. He was even more weak-minded than I'm used to. I don't think he's going to progress far in the service, but I still prefer this sort of thing to cutting people's arms off. And what's your plan for when we're past the Alliance blockade and dropping down into Corellia's atmosphere, with starfighters coming up to blast us out of the sky? Well, we can either transmit who we really are, and that we want to see Durgedjan, which will either get us an audience or get us assassinated, or we can try the Jedi mind tricks again. But it'll be harder to cover up, because lots of planetary sensor sites will have picked up our presence. Or we can orbit until we detect a distraction, and try to go to ground near that spot, using it for cover. Lando dithered for a few seconds. I say number three. And we can resort to number one if it starts to go bad on us. Leia smiled. You always did like to have a skifter in reserve. Chapter 7 Star System MZX-32905 Near Bimiel Today it was to be makeup. Good old-fashioned powders and pigments and pseudo-skin appliances. Lumia sat before a brightly lit mirror and got to work. It was painful, of course. Not long ago, Luke Skywalker had shot her five times with a blaster. Two of those shots had hit prosthetic limbs with simulated pain that could be switched off instantly and damage that could be repaired within minutes. But three of those shots had found meat, and despite the fact that she healed at an unnaturally high rate, both from force-based healing trances and from the alterations made to her body decades earlier by the science of Emperor Palpatine, she was far from recovered. She hurt. And that was why it was to be makeup today. When trying merely to hide her scarred features, she normally wore an identity-concealing scarf wrapped around her lower face. She could bring up the force illusion of normal features if obliged to reveal herself. But distracted as she now was by injuries, her control might slip, allowing viewers a glimpse of the real features beneath. Properly applied pseudo-skin didn't slip. Paint-on pseudo-skin eliminated the web of age lines at the corners of her eyes and mouth. Little pads affixed to the insides of her cheeks gave her face a rounder appearance. A dot of fluid that caused flesh to contract or even wither convincingly provided her with dimples. Pseudo-skin appliances covered her scars and gave her jaw a softer, less angular line. An application of foundation smoothed out all discrepancies of texture or tone. And on top of that, she added blush, a striking red lip color, eyeliner. She donned the wig at the end, covering her graying red hair with a tumbling mass of long golden curls. When she was done, she appeared to be a woman of thirty, roughly half her true age, and to possess the beauty and many of the racial stock characteristics of a woman of the Hapes Consortium. She drew on the force to dull her pain while she rose and dressed in a green gown and matching neck scarf both overlaid with a webwork of gold thread, and altogether too much sapphire jewelry, all appropriate to a wealthy hapen woman. It was important to dull the pain. If she hurt too much, she'd perspire, and her makeup would be undone. Dressed, she looked at herself in the mirror again, ensuring that the makeup had endured. The decorator is through with my battle dragon she said. A mnemonic, the phrase allowed her to recapture the hapen accent quickly. The decorator is through with my battle dragon. Ready and confident, she gave herself a nod, and then marched into the next room. It was a hemispherical holocom chamber, 
the central area, essentially a studio-quality stage, was surrounded by a ring of holocams that together would sample a three-dimensional image. Carefully programmed and adjusted for depth of field, they would only record images from that central area. They could not read objects farther away. That meant there was a safe zone around the central area, a ring where observers could stand and not be captured by the holocams. The walls were covered to a height of three meters by the broadcasting equipment, which transmitted via hyperspace, allowing instantaneous communications with targets half a galaxy away. Lumia's servant droids had set up the central area with a chair that plausibly looked like a marble throne. Lumia knew it to be foam plas covered in a beautiful mottled green and white veneer, and a matching side table. On the table was a bowl of peeled, oversized grapes. She sat carefully on the throne and sampled one of the grapes. It was gummy, nasty, not a true grape at all, but a candy-like material produced by an ancient food fabricator that had been new when this station was built. She smiled as though the grape were the best she'd ever tasted, and the pang of pain from her stomach wound would only add to an observer's impression that it was delightful. The chrono above the main comm board counted down the last few seconds remaining to her. As it neared zero, she said, Contact 339. Lights above the holocams flared up, bathing her in brightness, and the holocom unit activated with a surge of noise resembling the engine startup sound of a well-tuned high-performance speeder. The disembodied voice of the system computer male and pleasant, said, Contact. A moment later, it added, The target system is acknowledging. They are receiving. The computer's voice would be electronically scrubbed from the audio signal being sent. No return hologram appeared before Lumia. The target was receiving, but not yet responding. Lumia ignored the fact, presenting an appearance of unconcern while devoting herself to the bowl of repulsive grapes. After nearly thirty seconds, a hologram materialized before her. The image of a Bothan male, his fur mostly black with patches of tan, including one patch surrounding his eyes that gave him the appearance of a mask-wearer being broadcast in negative. He wore informal attire, gray pants, and a matching loose tunic that bared much of the fur of his chest and neck. Who are you, and how did you get this frequency and access code? Lumia finished her grape before turning her attention to the hologram. I am a humble daughter of a noble house, and I obtained these things by paying a fortune to the correct people. And you are Tathic Croylan, deputy intelligence leader for the esteemed world of Bathawi. Esteemed was perhaps too strong a word, but it was true that there was a certain amount of respect between the Hapens and Bothans. They did not have much contact, but each recognized in the other a mastery of political maneuvering, manipulation, and conspiracy. Croylan didn't bother to insist on her name. She hadn't offered it when asked. She wouldn't volunteer it. So, he said, you have my attention. Briefly. Lumia smiled. I will say things. You do not have to confirm or deny them. Then I will give you my frequency and access code. After this message ends, I suspect you will speak with your superiors, and then eventually initiate a return communication. Go ahead. Croylan was professionally civil. Even if he was outraged by this intrusion into his personal time, and by the fact that his security had been at least partially compromised, it wasn't smart to insult someone who could reach him this way. And it always helped to have very wealthy contacts. The Bothans are preparing three fleets for an assault on Galactic Alliance forces, Lumia said. A just response to what you have suffered at their hands, 
including a series of assassinations of key Bothan personnel on Coruscant. But your planners are impeded, because it will be impossible to launch the fleets from the Bathawi system and other origin points without being detected and probably shadowed by Galactic Alliance forces. This eliminates your ability to perform surprise attacks. The Bothan shrugged, looking at her as though he hadn't recognized a single term she'd used. So, she continued, I am communicating to inform you that I can blind the GA observers and give you an opportunity of, oh, ten to twenty standard hours in which to deploy your forces without being detected. Of course, to do this, I would have to have information sources planted deep within the GA government. And I do. I shall prove this by providing you with some information. Free, useful information. She modulated her voice, making it lower, more sultry. Favio, transmit the package. The computer's voice responded. At once, mistress. The files now coming up on your displays, Lumia continued, are from the internal records of the Galactic Alliance Guard. They include details on the assassinations I mentioned a moment ago. By details, I mean details that the Holonews services never had. Exact times, places, and methods of assassination. Personal items the victims were carrying. What the victims were doing before they were killed, including recordings of their conversations and transmissions. Things that only the killers and their superiors could possess. The fur rippled on Croylan's snout, just for a moment. It could have been nothing more than an itch. Lumia admired his self-control. As cold-blooded as the Bothans could be about such matters, Croylan could well have lost friends to this spree of assassination, and probably had. Irrespective of your earlier statements about imagined Bothan military activity, he said, if these files turn out to be accurate, you will earn our thanks. They will be most useful when we prosecute the killer or killers. You are welcome. Lumia gave him a nod, pure hapen condescension. Now I will go about other duties. The last file transmitted has information on how and when to reach me, should you need to. The Bothan opened his mouth to reply, but his hologram suddenly disappeared. Lumia's computer, primed to end the transmission when she made a specific statement, had done so. Lumia sagged in her chair. Her upright posture had put pressure on her abdomen, and it had been a drain through the second half of the conversation to keep the pain at bay. Now she could assume a more comfortable pose and concentrate on managing it. But she didn't have forever. The Bothans would check out her files, which would be verified. After all, she'd killed or arranged for the deaths of most of those Bothans. The details she had about those murders were accurate. And the Bothans would accept her further help. They had to. Now it was time to offer Jason a little aid. Transmit the Sio package to Coruscant and to Jason, she said. At once, mistress. Elmas Private Spaceport, Coronet Corellia, Lounge of the Love Commander. The insertion onto Corellia had not been as difficult a task as Leia and the others had feared. They'd maintained a high orbit near a cluster of Alliance vessels, nervously waiting for their intelligence authorization to be revealed as a fake until they had detected a small task force forming up. It consisted of a sensor-heavy shuttle, several starfighters, and a couple of bombers, obviously intended to make one or more reconnaissance passes over the planet's surface. Playing on their intelligence authorization, Han had calmed in, requesting permission to accompany the task force down into the atmosphere. Sure had come the mission commander's reply. 
But if you get blown up, you can't expect us to come back and pick up the pieces. So they had flown down at the tail end of the task force, had waited until a squadron of Corellian TIE fighters had fallen on the force, and had broken away, using terrain-following flying, as terrifying with Leia at the controls as it would have been with Han doing the honors, until they were well clear of the engagement zone and pursuit. Now, hours later, they waited in a hangar that cost a fortune to rent, but came with the scant protection offered by one smuggler when renting to another. Han's old contacts continued to pay off, so long as Lando was willing to pay out. They waited for nightfall, and the covering darkness it would bring, as slight as that might be in the heart of the city, and reviewed recent news broadcasts. One that was often cycled showed Wedge Antilles at his retirement announcement. He'd never retire at a time like this, Leia said. So he's being forced out. Lando smoothed his false beard. But is he being forced out because he didn't approve of the attack on Tenelka, or because it was his plan and it failed? Han snorted. He put his career on the line to retake Trollis with a minimum of casualties. That whole mess at Hapes couldn't have been his plan. It didn't work the way he thinks. But he'll know who was responsible, Lando said. I think we should ask him. Han and Leia exchanged a glance. It may not be as easy as that, Leia said. We've already tried to reach him by comlink. All we got was a recorded message saying that he and his family were celebrating his retirement by going on vacation. Not where... Not for how long. No information on how to reach him. Who would know? Their best friends are on the other side, Leia said. Tycho and Winter Selchu. Han frowned. He's leaving Corellia. Leia and Lando both looked at him. Lando looked confused, as if Han had been using stepping stones to cross a stream and Lando couldn't spot the stones to follow him. How do you figure that? Lando asked. His home is here. Han irritably waved that notion away. His home is the military. For him, Corelli is just a good place to retire. He didn't even grow up on planet. He grew up on a refueling station that doesn't exist anymore. No, he's got to get off-world. He's in disgrace with his former bosses, bosses who assassinate, and he's not going to leave his family vulnerable to them. He considered for a moment. He'll be in hiding now. What we'd have to do is figure out how he's going to get off-world, assuming he hasn't already, and meet up with him. And that would be a lot of work. Leia nodded. We may want to forget about him, and go straight for Durgedjan or Denjax Tepler instead. As it had on previous cycles, the Coronet newsfeed reached the Jedi Assassin's story. In related events, mystery surrounds the savage street attack by Galactic Alliance Jedi on unnamed Coronet citizens shortly after Admiral Antilles's retirement announcement. The holocam view switched to show a tall, strongly built young man dressed in sweat-stained agricultural coveralls, a big, panicky grin partially concealing his Bantha in searchlight's look. First rod or just shot first Jedi, he said, his voice marked by the distinctive twang of agrarian townships surrounding Coronet. Second rodder kicked second Jedi, put him right out. Whole thing took two seconds. The grin suddenly went from nervous to genuinely pleased. Jedi aren't so tough. Later, bunch of us are gonna go on a Jedi hunt. Leia grimaced. Fake Jedi? Or is the whole story fake? Not our problem, Han said. Dirk Gedjin is a reptile, and I don't intend to walk into his nest. Denjax Tepler may have no power, but he's been friendly before and may know something. Let's see if we can get to him. Coronet Corellia 
In the quietest hours of the morning, the three of them huddled around a small table in the most private sort of cantina. The privacy didn't come from remoteness. Situated on a major thoroughfare near the city's main spaceport, it was well-trafficked during daylight and evening hours. Because it catered so much to off-worlders and business traffic, its clientele was not chiefly made up of local regulars. Strangers elicited no curiosity. Bartenders with access to a modified spray pattern blaster discouraged trouble and the official attention trouble might bring, while a commercially-minded bar owner who paid all the correct under-the-table bills discouraged other official or criminal inspection. The table Han, Leia, and Lando sat at was toward the back of the main room, where the thousand colorful rays of light from above the bar decorations and along the wall glow rods fell only dimly. They had a good angle on the door, and looked up every time someone entered the cantina. And this time, they didn't instantly dismiss the new customer as a prospect. The glow rods above the door showed him to be wrapped in a cloak, its hood casting his face into deep shadow. He stood there as the door swung shut behind him and scanned the bar's interior. Not sure whether this was Tepler's intermediary, Han straightened, made a look-at-me motion, and caught the new customer's attention. The man walked over and, without invitation, sat on the table's fourth chair. He didn't lower his hood, but at this distance Han recognized Den Jack Stepler. His were handsome, if bland, features, the sort that belonged to a drinking buddy employed as a statistician or sales manager. Han cocked an eyebrow at him. Isn't it risky for you to travel alone? I thought for sure you'd send a Rodian with a scar and a limp to escort us to a secret hideaway. Tepler snorted. All my hideaways are being monitored. As I am. But a while back I hired a look-alike, and my surveillance follows him home, meaning I can sometimes walk around freely. With no bodyguards, Leia said. Tepler nodded. Yeah. He looked up as a waiter droid, a cylinder on wheels with eight arms, rolled up. Whiskey and water, he said, making his voice hoarse. Pre-war. The droid rolled away, and Tepler returned his attention to the others, particularly Lando. I don't know you. Lando extended his hand. Lando Calrissian. Tepler shook it. Nice to meet you. Though I think you picked a bad time to come out of retirement. Just as you picked a bad time to go into politics. True. Tepler turned back to Han and Leia. So why am I here? The attack on Queen Mother Tenel Ka, Leia said. Ah. First, Han said, did you have anything to do with it? Tepler shook his head. Or know anything about it? Not until it was underway. Han and I were at the site of the assassination attempt, Leia said. Because of that, and for some other reasons, the G.A. suspects us of being involved. And because we transmitted a warning to Tenelka, the Corellians blame us for spoiling the plan. So we're interested in clearing our names. And in beating the responsible parties until their skin sacks full of stew, Han added. Leia glanced at her husband. Her that wasn't entirely helpful look. She returned her attention to Tepler. Now, I know that doing what we ask puts you in a quandary. If you accept, technically you're betraying the secrecy acts of your government. A treasonable offense. But I also know you're opposed to a lot of what goes on. Thracken Sal Solo is dead, but his spirit lives on in portions of the new government. And whoever ordered the attack on Tenel Ka has become our enemy. Our enemies don't tend to fare very well, and we will do whatever we can to bring him or her down. So I put it to you that if you don't tell us who ordered that mission, 
it's only because it was someone you want to remain in power. Tepler was silent a long moment, not looking at any of them. The waiter rolled up during his pause and set down his drink. Tepler handed the droid a pair of cred coins, then sipped at the whiskey until the droid was out of earshot. Finally, he said, There's no such thing as treason anymore. You know that? Han and Leia exchanged a confused glance. How do you figure that, kid? Han asked. Everything you do helps someone. Everything you do hurts someone. Everything you do violates a law while supporting an ethic, or vice versa. The only differentiation is whether you do things out of selfishness or altruism. And altruism just means I'm doing this to create a better world as I define better. And if there's no such thing as treason anymore, there's also no such thing as loyalty. You know what I mean? He raised his glass again, and when he put it down, it was empty. Looking at him, Han felt a little pang of sympathy. Tepler's eyes seemed devoid of life. I think, Han said, when we leave Corellia, you ought to come with us. Tepler laughed. I can't leave. We can get you off-world no problem, Han said. We have a good transport. I know. It's at the Elmas port, correct? Han's hand fell automatically onto the butt of his holstered blaster. He took a quick look around, but no one other than the waiter droid seemed to be paying them any attention. He kept his voice low, under control. How did you know? Where else would you be? You're smugglers. Organized crime, of the syndicate kind, I mean, controls Port Pavaria, and Galactic Alliance Intelligence has its tentacles all through that place. If you were more upright GA citizens, you'd have had contacts there to berth with. And it's there that Corsac is doing most of its looking for that mystery transport that made landfall earlier today. But smugglers of the old-fashioned freelance kind, they have most of their contacts over at Elmas, as they have for generations. If Corsac had any idea that it was Han Solo who made landfall, that's where they'd be right now, in force. Oh. Han sat back and forced himself to relax. A little. But that supports my point. We can get you off-world. I'm no good with a blaster, Tepler said. Lando frowned. You know, you're more than commonly confusing to talk to, even for a politician. I'm not a hand-to-hand -hand combatant, Tepler went on. And I'm an indifferent pilot. I don't have an affinity for technical gear. But listening to people... Sorting out truth from lies, guessing at motivations, manipulating people, encouraging them, maneuvering them. That's where I'm strong. You know, politics. I still don't get it, Han said. Leia spoke up. He's saying that politics is his battlefield, and you're encouraging him to run away from the battle. Oh, Han thought about it. Yeah, I am. Tepler turned a sad but scornful expression onto him. Do you also encourage all your friends to run away from their fights? Han shook his head. Not for a long time. Not since I got to know them and realized that they had a chance to win. You, kid, don't have that chance. If you stay here, you're going to die. Yeah, probably. Tepler stared into the depths of his whiskey tumbler. My ex-wife went on her last diplomatic mission knowing she might die. 
And she did. Am I so much less than she is? The others looked among themselves, for once at a loss for words. But Tepler was the first to speak. Der Gedgen, he said. Complete sentences, please, Lando said. Der Gedgen was the chief planner for and signed off on the mission to kill the Queen Mother Tenelka. Leia nodded. And it was an assassination mission, not a kidnapping attempt? If they had grabbed her, they would have killed her. Leia pressed on. Wedge Antilles? He didn't know about it. He was ordered to step down because he didn't support waging a war that dirty. Tepler held up his glass, a signal to the waiter droid to refill it. Leia felt a little trickle of alarm, but it seemed remote, not directed at her. Closing her eyes, she extended her awareness through the Force to areas beyond her immediate surroundings, through the ceiling and floors, walls on all sides. Outside the front door and wall, she found outrage. Someone wanting to come in, but being prevented. More than one someone. A gradual massing of bodies. She opened her eyes. The waiter droid was just rolling up. She asked the droid, What's immediately beneath us? That would be the storage and distillery rooms, my lady, the waiter said, its voice cultured like C-3PO's, but not as sing-song. We no longer do tours of our micro-distillery, but the floor is available for rent for private parties, holodrama recordings. Quiet. Leia said. Han, Lando, door. The front door slammed open, and two Corsac agents in battle armor, carrying blaster rifles, were the first ones through it. Han's blaster cleared its holster, and Lando tipped the table over toward the intruders, providing cover. Han shot the first intruder in his chest armor. The blast didn't penetrate, but the impact knocked the man backward into a new wave of Corsac enforcers trying to get through the door. Tepler dived behind the table, switching his tumbler to his left hand, drawing his own holdout blaster with his right. He fired over the table edge. His shot hit the glowing street sign over the door, incinerating it, raining sparks down on the intruders jammed there. Leia ignited her lightsaber. She spun to crouch behind the table, then plunged the glowing blade into the floor. She began to drag it around in a wide circle. The second intruder fired at the only upright figure in the vicinity. His blaster rifle shot hit the waiter droid at about knee level and neatly severed the cylinder there. With a somewhat inconvenienced-sounding cry of, I say, the droid toppled sideways. The tray of drinks and empty glasses it had been carrying crashed to the floor. A wave of shattered glass, half-melted ice, and unbreakable transparisteel containers washed across table, chair, and patron legs. Lando extracted his blaster from beneath the folds of his hip cloak. He brought it up parallel with Hans and fired, catching the faceplate of the intruder who had shot the droid. That man, too, staggered back and down, adding to the congestion at the doorway. Leia finished her sweep with the lightsaber, and a rough circle of flooring a meter and a half in diameter dropped away into darkness, rattling against a hard surface a moment later. Let's go, she said, making it sound like a suggestion, and dropped through. Her lightsaber lit her new surroundings. She was in a darkened, narrow corridor. Lando looked at Han. You first. He took another shot at the doorway, catching a Corsac trooper in the second rank right on the kneecap. Han gestured for Lando to go. Age before beauty. Idiots. Tepler dropped through, blaster in one hand and tumbler in the other, landing awkwardly behind Leia. Rear ranks of invaders shoved the plug of stunned or injured troopers out of the doorway. Four spilled into the bar, more jamming up at the door. Han fired again and caught one in his armored gut, sending him spinning to the floor. The others returned fire, and Han, braced behind the tabletop, 
stared in alarm as whole chunks of its artificial wood surface were torn away, not impeding the blaster bolts in the least. Beside him, Lando slid through the hole. He kept his cane from colliding with anything, but his hip cloak caught on the edge of the hole and was yanked free of his shoulders. He landed gracefully and glared up at his traitorous garment. Then he trotted after Leia. Han grabbed one table leg and fell through the hole, hauling the leg with him. All four table legs dropped into the hole, leaving the tabletop flush against the floor. The awkwardness of his descent caused him to hit the corridor floor hard and go to his knees, but he rose unhurt and sprinted after the others, guided by the glow-rod-like qualities of Leia's lightsaber. Han rounded a corner and caught up with the others. This chamber was as large as the taproom above, but stacked high with plasteel crates and false wood kegs. Leia stood at the top of a short permacrete ramp. A metal door barred her way. She slashed at the top hinge of three, cutting through it. Tepler stood behind her, calm, blaster and tumbler at the ready. Lando, like a catalog hollow of elegant indifference, leaned against the wall, twirling his cane. Han gestured toward Tepler's tumbler. Get rid of that. Can't, Tepler said. It has my fingerprints on it. Han grabbed the tumbler from him, tossed it into a corner, and pumped three blaster shots into it. When the smoke cleared, it was a melted, charred mass of transparent steel. There were more blaster shots from back the way they'd come. Han heard pieces of wood raining down into the corridor. Leia finished the second hinge and got to work on the third. Tepler stepped forward and raised his arm to catch the top of the door when it toppled. The door fell. Tepler wrenched it out of the way, and it clattered to the permacrete floor. On the other side, the ramp continued up. Several meters beyond it, Han could see speeders roaring past what had to be the end of the alley behind the cantina. He, Leia, and Tepler ran toward the escape the street represented. Lando remained behind. To delay pursuit, Han assumed. Leia extinguished her lightsaber as they reached the alley mouth. A narrow sidewalk gave them an avenue for escape, and cross-traffic just a few centimeters away roared past, the speeder's running lights leaving colorful horizontal streaks in the air. Han looked at the situation. This was going to turn into either a running blaster battle or a blaster battle performed on stolen speeders. Ready to go, sweetheart? Garbage loader, Leia said. You always know the right thing to say. Han followed her gaze. Lumbering up the flyway toward them, low toward the ground, was a repulsor lift based garbage loader, a story and a half tall, wider than a standard traffic lane with droid arms along its upper rim to seize garbage receptacles, lift them into the air, and dump their contents into the vessel's payload bay. Leia led them from the alley and along the sidewalk in the direction of traffic, but she walked backward, concentrating on the pilot of that garbage loader. Nice time for a nap, she whispered. Good place for a nap. Lando ran from the alley mouth neither leg apparently causing him distress. He carried his cane tucked under his left arm, military academy style. We have maybe fifteen seconds, he said. Then he gave Leia a curious look and turned to stare at the object of her interest. The trash loader pulled over until it was mostly in the traffic lane, but also fully covering the sidewalk, and came down to a landing directly in front of the alley mouth. The pilot, illuminated by blue cockpit lighting, was a jowly middle-aged man. He leaned back in his seat and closed his eyes. Kill the engines, Leia said, and sagged just a bit. The effort to impose her will on someone at range, without the benefit of the target being able to see her eyes or hear her voice, had taken a toll on her. Han and Lando obliged by aiming their blasters at the front face of the garbage loader's underside and firing four or five times each into it. The blaster fire immediately awoke the pilot, and Han saw the man seize the controls and try to lift off, but it was too late. The multi-ton vehicle was dead, 
firmly situated flush with the alley mouth. Now Han could hear curses and hammering from where the loader blocked the alley. The Corsac agents had reached the obstacle. Time to grab a speeder and run for it, Lando said. Tepler shook his head. I'll be less conspicuous on foot and on my own. Good luck. He turned and dashed away along the sidewalk. Chapter 8 Elmas Private Spaceport, Coronet Corellia, Rental Bay 601208 Dad, something's happening outside. Instantly awake, still dressed in a jumpsuit not much improved by having been worked in for a day, Wedge rolled out of his cot and joined his daughter at the hangar's side viewport. The viewport was mostly covered in black sheeting, in which Miri and Iella had cut strategic holes for viewing. The interior of the hangar was in darkness, so it took his eyes no time to adjust. Across the accessway between rows of rental hangars, three people were making a hurried approach. They stopped well short of Wedge's hangar and clustered around a personnel door two hangars down. Not our problem, Wedge said, rubbing his eyes. He'd gotten to sleep only an hour or two earlier, after a long session of performing vehicle repairs and maintenance. Miri had been right to awaken him, but he was anxious to get back to sleep. I think it is. The voice was Corin's, from just behind Wedge, and Wedge started. He turned to offer Corin a mock glare. Ex-Corsec and Jedi. Makes you twice as sneaky. What makes you think it's a problem? You can't even see out there. But I can feel. Corin gestured toward the distant arrivals. One of them is Leia Solo. Wedge whipped around and put his eye to the peephole again. The three people had disappeared, presumably having gone through the door. You're sure? I'm sure. What's all the noise? Stumbling down the boarding ramp of the Pulsar Skate, her Baudo-class yacht, covering a yawn and half-smothering her words with one hand, was Mirax Horn, Corin's wife, and Miri's namesake. Wedge had known her for decades. She was the daughter of Booster Tarek, Wedge's mentor in the smuggling trade back in the days before Wedge joined the Rebel Alliance. Round-faced, with black hair cut in a short, practical style, she retained much of the fresh-faced, blue-eyed beauty that had characterized her when she and Wedge were both teenagers. Leia's two doors down, with two strange men, Wedge said. How do you know they're two strange men? Mirax asked. It might be Han and Luke. Han and Luke are two strange men. Wedge looked around the people assembled before him. Only Iella was still horizontal. On her cot, beneath the S-foil of Wedge's X-wing, she had pulled her pillow over her head to muffle all the conversational noise. In a couple of minutes, when they've had time to relax, we'll send someone over. Me, Miri said. I'm the only one of us whose face isn't all over Corsex or Assassin's shoot-on-sight guides. Corin gave her a melancholy little smile. It's not going to happen, girl. Uncle Corin, if you're going to give me the same old you're-too-young argument, Corin cut her off with a gesture and a shake of his head. Listen. Everyone did. They could all hear the rush of thrusters and repulsor lifts. Wedge found it curious that he couldn't identify the speeder from its engine noise. Then he realized why. He wasn't listening to one speeder close by— but to several farther away, their engine and thruster noises blending together and echoing off hangar walls. And the noise was getting louder. Closer. Iella, Wedge called. His wife pulled the pillow from her face and looked at him, cross but alert. Everyone, set up for immediate evacuation. Iella rolled up out of her cot and began struggling into her boots. She caught Wedge's attention then glanced in the direction of his cotton boots. Up the access way, from the direction Leia and her companions had come, a stream of Corsac speeders, 
orange and blue lights blinking to signal their official status, roared toward them, each coming to a stop in front of a different hangar. Corsac officers poured out of the vehicles and immediately began moving to hangar entryways. One began banging on the door into Wedge's shelter. Corin sighed. Thanks, Leia. Corellia, control cabin of the Love Commander. Power coming online in two minutes, Leia announced. Lando tried to keep his dissatisfaction from his face. I hate transports with slow start-up times, he grumbled. If that idiot had had any sense, he'd have installed a ten-second starter. If he'd had any sense, he wouldn't have lost his yacht to you, Han said. Relax. We have plenty of time. Through the front viewports, they could all see the line of sparks appear at the hangar door as a laser cutting tool outside sheared through the locking mechanism. The door rolled open and half a dozen Corsac agents charged in. Just outside, making the final turn to aim at the love commander, was an old, though doubtless still deadly, TIE crawler. The ball-shaped cockpit, familiar from TIE fighters, was mounted between two low rectangular sets of tank treads, and Lando could see the machine's twin blaster cannon barrels trained squarely on love commander's control cabin. A Corsac officer with an oversized comlink held up before his face entered with his men. His words came across Love Commander's comm board, and, magnified, could even be heard through the yacht's hull. This is Corellian security. Power down and exit your craft immediately for identification. Leia, stall them, Lando ordered. We can get our shields online in just over a minute. Leia shook her head. No. They're serious. They'll open fire before then. We can surrender now and escape while we're being transported. Han's lip had twitched when the word surrender was uttered, and now he shook his head. Princess, we— There was an engine roar from outside. All the Corsac agents still outside looked to their right. Some of them ran, into the hangar and toward the love commander— or out of sight on the access way, anywhere that wasn't toward the tie crawler. A flash of red light hit the crawler's starboard treads, low, almost at the level of the permacrete. The shot flipped the crawler, and it rolled, coming down resting on one of its treads. A starfighter flashed by outside. That was an X-wing, wasn't it? Lando asked. Leia nodded. Wedge? Han shook his head. Emerald green, with a checkerboard pattern. Leia smiled. Corin. Then an X-wing in standard gray with red piping flashed by. Power? Lando asked. Leia checked her status board. Coming online in three, two, one, now. Shields up, Lando ordered. Get us out of here. Leia lifted Love Commander up on her repulsors and glided forward. Corsac agents scattered out of her way. At the door into the hangar, she delicately nudged the tie crawler aside. Delicately, in the sense that neither vehicle was damaged by the impact. Though Lando shuddered at the sound of metal shrieking and scraping as they passed, then turned in the wake of the two X-wings. Immediately, the sensor screens lit up and began chiming. Lando activated his display screen and got a nightside image, all in shades of green, of the holocam view from the front of Love Commander. He saw little but a line of Corsac speeders parked on the access way. I read one vehicle, size suited to a personal yacht, emerging from a hangar behind us, Han said. Hey, I think it's the Pulsar Skate. Lando switched his display over to a rear holocam view. Emerging from a hangar door only two buildings away was a long, low yacht, shaped something like an example of gliding undersea life from the aquatic world of Mon Calamari. Essentially a flying wing with twin thruster pods at the back, it had graceful lines that swept back organically from the bow. Han continued, We have one vertical takeoff from the port's main launch area, 
I think it's a ballistic transport outbound. And... Fear feck. Looks like a small vessel, Corvette class at least, heading our way. Go to battle stations, Lando said unnecessarily. The shields were already up, and he'd seen Han power up the yacht's weapons without authorization a moment earlier. Yes, Captain. Try to open a channel to our escorts. Yes, Captain. Han scowled at Lando, then returned his attention to his boards. Leia lifted Love Commander off in the wake of the X-Wings. Lando felt himself being pressed back into his seat as the yacht's inertial compensators failed to keep up completely with the demands of vehicular acceleration. Love Commander to X-Wing Escort, come in. Love Commander, this is Pulsar Skate. It was a female voice, and one Lando didn't recognize. Stand by to receive line-of-sight transmission of encryption code. Three, two, one, sending. Got it? Got it, Han said. Implementing now. There was a burst of static. Then the woman's voice returned. Encryption activated. Can you still read me? We hear you just fine, Han said. I'm going to switch you over to our captain. I'm going to have to shoot things pretty soon, and he doesn't have anything to do. He pressed a button. The holocam view faded from Lando's display and was replaced with the face of a girl, young, pretty, with blue hair highlighted by yellow streaks. She looked familiar. Miri Antilles here, she said. Impromptu comm officer for Pulsar Skate. Suddenly, Lando felt ten thousand years old. The last time he'd seen Miri, she'd been a little girl. He forced a smile. Miri, it's your Uncle Lando. Lando, hey! The white hair and beard look really good on you. Are they real? No, of course not. It's a wig and makeup. Ah, uh, you've lost all your hair? No, my hair is black. Well, gray-black. This just isn't it. I still have all my own hair. Sure you do, Han whispered. Lando gritted his teeth. Miri, sweetheart, does your daddy have an exit vector? Sure. First we go shoot at the Corvette. No, no, no. We need to go away from the Corvette. The Corvette's all alone over the ocean, and every other direction has multiple starfighters and attack craft coming toward us. And assuming we can cripple the Corvette... We should make orbit with no problem. But then we run into the Alliance blockade ships. That's where the problem comes in. Suddenly, Lando felt young and useful again. Ah, that's no problem. No? No. A kind young blockade lieutenant gave me a passcode the other day. Oh, good. Oops, we're at extreme firing range in ten seconds. Nine... As Miri counted down... Lando switched his display view to a sensor screen. Their miniature task force was now away from Coronet, out over the water, still gaining altitude. There were numerous blips back over the city, small units of attack craft headed their way. Mercifully, Han was screening their comm traffic and keeping it from coming over the control cabin speakers. Love Commander and Pulsar Skate were now side by side, only a couple of hundred meters separating them and the two X-Wings were a few kilometers out in advance. In the distance was the blip of a small capital ship, and as the distance closed, a designation popped up for it on the screen. CEC Corvette 1177 Syllaban. Lando winced out of sympathy for Leia. When she was just a teenage senator for the planet of Alderaan, her chief transport had been a Corellian Corvette, the Tantive IV, long and narrow, with a bow like a sledgehammer head turned sideways and a rectangular stern that was little more than stacked banks of thrusters, the Tentive Four had held a special place in her affections, and it had to be upsetting to have a near-identical vessel trying to shoot her down now. Neary's countdown reached one. Lando opened his mouth to order Han to open fire, but Han opened up before he could speak. 
Lando saw the yacht's lasers lance in on a distant target, joined by the pulsar skates, and saw the glow as the Siliban's shields soaked up the laser barrage. The two X-wings climbed relative to the plane of battle, performing evasive maneuvering in unison, so close that they registered as a single blip on the sensors. Lando frowned over that. What do they think they're doing? They're going to bump, and then it'll be all over for them. He'd forgotten his comm channel was still open. Bump? The voice was that of Mirax Horn. Come over here, Lando, and I'll bump you. Calm down, calm down. That was Iella. This is why men should only be put in command of single pilot fighters. On bigger craft, they have too much time on their hands, so they talk too much. Hey, Lando protested. Love Commander rocked as beams from the Corvette's twin turbolaser cannons grazed her shields. Lando started to say something about more evasive maneuvering, but Leia abruptly put the yacht into such torturous dives and turns that Lando's stomach flip-flopped. He clamped his mouth shut and concentrated on not losing his dinner. Through the viewport, he could see the Corvette's bottom turbolasers firing on the Love Commander and Pulsar Skate, and the craft's topside turbolasers trying to target the X-Wings. As they neared the Corvette, the X-Wings abruptly separated, both staying above the relative plane of battle, but one arcing to port and the other to starboard. Both sets of turbolasers initially followed the same X-Wing, wedges, according to the sensor screen, then both switched to open up on Corins. By this time, both X-Wings were past the stern of the Corvette. Lando could see some bright spots at the stern of the Corellian ship, points where fire from the X-Wings' turbolasers had struck. Now both X-Wings looped around to orient in on the engines, and the Corvette commander belatedly recognizing that the two snub fighters packed more firepower than the yachts still headed their way, tried to turn toward them and protect his engines. But the X-Wings came in firing, their angry red laser fire chipping away at the stern shields, concentrating on the same area of engines, and then penetrating. Lando saw red lights suffuse the corvette's stern, and an explosion lit the ocean below. No, the corvette hadn't exploded. Only a portion of its engine compartment had been lost, but the vessel began to lose altitude and turned away from the conflict area. The X-Wings turned back toward the space yachts. And finally, because he had the ticket off this world and out of this system, Lando could take charge again. Pulsar skate, he said, and X-Wing escorts. Form up on love, Commander. We're headed for orbit. And then where? Han asked. Finally, Wedge's voice crackled over the comlink. To a gathering of old friends, he said. Coruscant, Jedi Temple Ben's opponent wasn't particularly impressive. The droid had a scrawny body, its four spindly legs just sturdy enough to allow it to walk around. Its two arms ended not in hands, but in tubes about eight centimeters in diameter, and its head was huge, the size of an entire R2 unit, with two green glowing optical sensors where eyes would be, and a set of speaker vents in the position of a human mouth. In the mirror that ran the full length of the chamber on one wall, they seemed unlikely combatants, a droid with a ludicrously large head and a friendly-looking teenage boy with bright red hair in a Buzz-style haircut. Last series, it announced, its voice surprisingly human considering its alien appearance. Ready. To better test himself, Ben left his lightsaber off for the moment, and turned his back on the droid. He extended his feelings through the Force and tried to find the droid and was mildly distressed once again to find that he could not. He concealed his worry. Ready. There was a punk noise as the first foam steel ball left one of the droid's arm tubes, and that Ben felt as a displacement of air. 
as a little tickle of worry. He could sense the direction of the ball's travel, straight toward the back of his head. He swung around, sidestepping the ball's path, igniting the lightsaber as second, third, and fourth balls shot out toward him. He swung at the first one, but his blade was only half extended and his strike was half a meter short of its target. The second ball shot harmlessly past him, but he connected with the third and fourth, sending them ricocheting away from him. Their glossy exteriors took the momentary contact with the coherent light blade without melting or deforming. Then more balls came pouring from the droid's arms. Ponk, 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 ponk. The droid varied its aim, firing at Ben's feet, chest, head, arms, aiming at positions bracketing Ben in case his dodging moved him into their path. He didn't deflect all of them. One cracked painfully into his left knee, another grazed his cheek, but his success ratio was pretty high. He could feel the balls moving around behind him along the gleaming Apasha hardwood floor. They separated into two streams, circling around him back toward the droid, controlled by the magnetic impulses it was sending. As Ben watched and deflected two more balls, the first ones that had been sent against him reached the base of the droid, flew up to hover above the droid's head, and dropped into the slot there. Back in the hopper, they could be fired at him again. On impulse, Ben chose one of the balls now approaching the droid and reached out to it through the force. He stomped with his foot, physicalizing the way he wanted to direct his attack, and lashed out with force energy. The ball flattened, becoming a disc wider than but about half as tall as it had been before. It still flew up to hover above the droid's head, and when it dropped toward the slot, Ben gave it some extra energy. It hit the slot and half folded, jamming into place. Swatting away at the next four balls, Ben watched as half a dozen more dropped onto the droid's head, bounced off the ruined ball, fell to the floor, and rolled around to get to the backs of the two lines of balls awaiting retrieval. No more balls emerged from the droid. Ben waited, watching, as expended balls from the two lines flew up over the droid, bounced off, fell to the ground, and got back in line again. Then that action, too, ceased. Released from magnetic control, most of the balls now stayed where they lay. A few rolled a handspan in one direction or another before coming to a stop. Ben felt the tiniest of tugs against his lightsaber. He gripped it hard just before it tried to yank itself out of his hand. It struggled with him, attempting to fly to the droid. But he got his left hand on it as well and held firm. He deactivated it and grinned at the practiced droid. Finally, the lightsaber, too, stopped trying to move on its own. The droid said, Have you sabotaged me? Yes, Ben said, in the, uh, spirit of defeating an enemy. I shall file your action under tactics, then. I designate this exercise complete. Last series success ratio 94%. Last series ended at 22% of balls expended due to tactical sabotage. Learner weapon retention successful. The droid rolled toward the door out of the training hall, and the balls, now returning to their straight-line formations, rolled out after it. Leaving, the droid passed another Jedi learner waiting beside the door. She must have entered while Ben was in the midst of the last exercise, and he recognized with a little flash of embarrassment that he hadn't detected her. He had been too focused on his task. She was several centimeters taller than he was, three or four years older, and red-headed, her long hair a shade more coppery than his mother's. She came forward as the balls continued to roll out of the hall. Hello. Hello. Ben returned his lightsaber to its belt hook. She extended a hand. I'm Siha. Siha Dorvald. I know. He took her hand to shake it. I've... There was something in her hand. Something small and rectangular. A card of some sort. But her expression didn't change. She didn't acknowledge that she'd just handed him anything. 
A little thrill shot through Ben. He knew why. First, she was really good-looking, and she was talking to him. Second, she'd just done something covert. He wondered what was on the card. Instructions to meet her somewhere? A communication from the government of Corellia, begging his help to resolve the military crisis? An offer of a bribe? He'd just been kicked out of a practice session, straight into a holodrama, and he keenly felt the transition. I've seen you around, he finished, trying not to stammer. I'm Ben Skywalker. I know. She retrieved her hand, leaving the card in his grip. I just wanted to say, pocket the card now? No, if anyone is watching, that might call attention to the fact that she gave me something. And if she's giving me something this way, she thinks somebody is watching. Ben let his hand drop to his side and hoped his posture was natural-looking. I thought the thing with flattening the ball was very imaginative, and I was wondering— He had to get to his quarters and find out what was on the card, though he'd also like to just stay here and look at her for a couple of days. It was very hard for him to concentrate on see his words. If you'd mind if I— You know— sort of stole your technique for my next session. About forty different answers roared in to clog up Ben's brain. Sure, you're really cute. If you're still doing these exercises, are you a late starter like me? Your accent is very undercity, but you talk like you've been educated. How would Jason answer her question? That last thought allowed Ben to clear his mind. He'd analyze her question instantly figure out the consequences, and be very cool about it. I'd be, um, what was the word? Flattered. But before the last word left his lips, a possible consequence occurred to him. But you probably don't want to do that. Why not? She didn't seem offended, just curious. Ben gestured at the doorway. The droid has a learning program. He'll be coming up with or requesting new programming to counteract a ball-flattening tactic. So if you do that, you also need to figure out what he'll do then and be prepared for that, too. Good point. I'll do that. You're smart, too. Too? In addition to what? I was wondering about your braid. She pointed to the narrow braid of hair that dangled from his scalp especially obvious when contrasted with his buzz cut. It was now draped across his shoulder. That's kind of old-fashioned, isn't it? Does the Order still do that somewhere? Ben shook his head. No, just me. He wasn't even sure why he'd grown it out. Just to have something that was his alone, perhaps. Something to set him apart from his famous parents. He wasn't sure how to say that in a way that wouldn't sound juvenile or egotistical. It's my custom. I think it's astral. Anyway, I need to get to my next lesson. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. He watched her leave, feeling as though he had to be flushing as red as her hair, and finally tucked the card she'd given him into his belt, hoping that the action would not be obvious to unseen eyes. In addition to what? On the walk back to his quarters, he thought about what to do. The fact that Siha seemed to think she or he or both of them would be under observation bothered him. Are Dad and Mom having me watched? That question left a sour taste in his mind. Or is someone watching Siha? But if I'm the one being watched, how do I find out what's on the card? Not a temple computer. That could be monitored. Come to think of it, so could any datapad capable of transmitting and receiving. But a datapad without a comlink would be safe, if he could find one. Or make one. He stopped in at a playroom set aside for Rontos, students three to five years younger than Ben. There were no children or adults present, but there were games and toys scattered here and there among the cushiony chairs and other brightly colored items of furniture. 
as he knew there must be, there were datapads, most of them with larger controls suited to smaller, clumsier fingers, and one of them had a privacy headset. He took it. He stepped into a closet used to hold cleaning supplies. Standing in the narrow gap between shelves holding pungent-smelling bottles and plasteel containers, he opened the datapad and quickly stripped out its communications chip. He felt nervous doing this anywhere in the temple, but didn't think that, even if he was under near-constant observation, they could have put holocams everywhere. Not in a cleaning supply closet. Surely not. In his quarters, he moved his chair so that he could sit with his back to a corner. He made a slightly exaggerated show of selecting a game card from his small collection of entertainments. As he was sitting down, he palmed the game card and inserted Siha's instead. Then he donned the headset and accessed the card. The Galactic Alliance guard logo came up with a brief message. Special Agent Ben Skywalker. Enter access code. Ben typed in the password he used in the GAG offices to access messages and orders. The message changed to say, Sound mode for secure surroundings or text mode for public areas. He chose sound. The screen flickered and Jason's image came up. Ben, Jason said, his voice a little thin over the headset speakers. This is important. Memorize the information on this card. Replay it if necessary. Once you're sure you have it memorized, destroy the chip. Don't just break it. Destroy it irretrievably. He paused, as if to give Ben time to absorb the gravity of his words. Ben felt that thrill again. This is real. This is important. And... This means Siha is working with Jason. She's an ally. I need to send you on a mission, Jason continued. You specifically. Because it has to be someone with the GAG's interests. My interests at heart. Someone who is Force-sensitive, and someone who has proven that he can operate alone. That's you or me and I can't leave my duties at this time. I'm sorry about interrupting your training, and sorrier still that this may cause friction between you and your parents, but I'll make them understand that this was all my doing. Here's the essential core of the mission. Remember it, so that if anything goes wrong with the operational details I give you, you'll remember what's most important. You're to acquire the Amulet of Kalara, and secretly bring it to me. The image switched to a standard planetary data screen, with the name Almania at the top. Jason's voice continued, The Amulet is on the planet of Almania, in the planetary offices of Tendrondo Arms. It resides in a display case on the 215th floor of their office building. Security in the building is nothing special, since it's shared by hundreds of different firms. And security on the display case is also poor, because the owner doesn't know what he possesses. The image changed to a close-up view of a jewel hanging from a silver chain. The jewel was a gray oval, its surface knobby and textured rather than smooth. In the center of the face was a vertical bar of some ruby-like gem, flanked by lustrous black semi-precious stone. The effect was rather like looking at a silvery feline eye with a red slitted pupil. This is the Amulet of Kalara, Jason continued. Now the important thing. Ben, if this gets into the hands of a Force-sensitive who knows the secrets of its activation, we're all in trouble. Because while such a person has it activated, he will be invisible in the Force. Even his use of the Force is invisible to other Force users. Think about what that means. He'll be like one of the Yuzhan Vong warriors, 
but can be a normal person. Human, Rhodian, Biff, whatever. He would be a tremendous danger to your parents, the Order, me, everyone and everything. If you find the amulet in its display case, wonderful. We're going to give you a replacement to leave for the real thing. Mission accomplished, but if anyone gets his hands on it. The image switched back to Jason, and he was even more grave than before. You have to assume that he knows its secret that he's a powerful, dark Jedi or other Force-sensitive, and that he can activate it at any moment. Then you have to eliminate him before he eliminates you. I'm sorry, but it's true. A weight settled in Ben's stomach. What Jason was suggesting sounded like, under the right circumstances, it could be murder. But if the amulet was what Jason said, it had to be put in the right hands. Had to be. So, at any point in the next two nights, you need to visit the temple's fourth-level exercise changing room. Open the leftmost locker, combination 686, and retrieve the packet of clothes and items there. Chapter 9 Clad in nondescript rust-colored garments and a hooded green traveler's rain drape that would remind no one of Jedi robes, Ben shut the locker, hit the button to lock it again, and dropped his lightsaber into a belt pouch. He forced his shoulders down. He'd been edgy since entering the chamber, worried that someone would walk in on him as he changed. But it hadn't happened. He'd chosen the quietest hour of the night, and had chosen correctly. He moved to the loading slot for the laundry chute. It was large enough to accommodate the cloth bags full of dirty clothes, labeled with the names of their owners that were delivered to the laundry facilities. That meant that it was large enough for children, too. Rumor had it that children couldn't get through the chutes into the automated laundry facilities, but just exactly how they were prevented from descending was a mystery. Apprentices who'd tried it told mutually contradictory stories of greased chutes, robot defenders with electrocuting or tickling attachments on their arms, barrel-shaped chambers that whirl defenders until they were sick, stern talkings to, and extra chores. Ben pulled the lever, opening the drum into which bags were to be placed, and crawled in. It was a tight fit. At thirteen, almost fourteen, he was physically just a little large for such a stunt. He used his body weight to roll the drum closed, which opened the chute access immediately beneath him. Bracing himself with arms and legs so as not to fall, he pulled out a glow rod and peered into the depths. That's a chute, all right, he said. It was a square plasteel hole leading into the depths of the temple. He maneuvered himself to enter the chute feet first, and braced them against the walls. Then he focused his attention on what he was doing, calling on the force to allow him to dictate the exact amount of friction his feet would experience against the chute sides. And he dropped. He did not so much fall as descend in a controlled skid. As he descended, he could see the edges of the individual plasteel panels that made up the chute. He passed a sensor. What would it be sensing, he wondered, Nothing right now. Siha or some other ally of Jason's would have disabled it. Below him, he saw discolored patches along the chute sides. He increased the friction to slow down and descended past them at the pace of a crawling insect. On one side was a panel with a hinge at the bottom. He poked it as he passed, and it swung freely open, then shut again. Directly opposite it was inset a small but ordinary repulsor unit, the sort one might find on the bottom of a hover chair or hover gurney. He nodded. That made sense. The sensor had to detect density or mass. If something dropped by that was too dense, 
boys and girls being made of denser materials than bags full of laundry, then the repulsor would kick on, shoving the child into a side chute, probably sending him or her to a holding cell and notifying the appropriate masters in charge of punishment, lectures, and chores. Ben slid on past and picked up the pace. Below was a small square of light, and it was getting larger. The end of the chute. Ben skidded to a silent stop when he was still two meters above it. Warm air rose past him, and he heard the hum and clank of machinery. Three meters below the end of the chute was a smooth, wear-darkened permacrete floor with several gray laundry bags lying in a pile. As Ben watched, a wheeled wagon rolled into view, pushed by a nondescript silver-white droid. The droid picked up the bags, tossed them in the wagon, and then pushed the conveyance out of sight. Extending his senses through the force, Ben could detect the droid's movement, but he could feel nothing else moving in the immediate vicinity. He dropped the remaining five meters, rolled as he hit the permacrete, and came silently up on his feet. In one direction, the droids retreating back. In the other, no observers. Either way, he was looking at an undecorated access corridor, machinery or storage crates piled here and there against a wall. Often there was nothing concealing the drab grayness of the surfaces. The glow rods mounted in the ceiling, widely separated and offering only low light, created an even more dismal appearance. Per Jason's instructions, Ben turned right and dashed silently in that direction. Soon enough, the main corridor made a ninety-degree turn to the left, but there was a door in the wall there. Heavy metal with an imposing-looking durasteel rim, it was labeled Emergency Evacuation Access. Use only in times of emergency. Temple security will be alerted. Only in times of emergency. Well, the whole galaxy was facing a time of emergency. Ben shoved at the metal panel that constituted the mechanical opener, to be used in times of power failure, and he felt his shoulders hunch up again as he unconsciously anticipated an activated alarm. But none came. Siha had done her job well. The door swung smoothly into a very short permacrete corridor, unlit and there was an identical door at the far end five meters away. Ben responsibly shut the first door behind him, making sure that it latched into place. He might be disobeying the wishes of his father, but that was no excuse for exposing the Jedi Temple to possible intrusion by an enemy. The Order had enemies, like the woman his father kept mentioning, Lumia. The second door also opened without activating an alarm but sound washed over Ben anyway, and warm, heavy air. It was raining, individual drops pinging off a surface over his head. In the moments before his eyes adjusted, he could see the lights of traffic streams to his right, but they were broken up, somehow disconnected. He doused his glow rod and shut this door, too. When his eyes did adjust, he found that he was in a strange durasteel framework, long and narrow like a corridor. The floor and ceiling were metal sheeting, but the sides were mostly vertical metal bars with very narrow gaps between them. Through the gaps to the left, he could see only dressed stone, probably the temple exterior. To the right was darkness and Coruscant cityscape. Quietly, he moved toward the end of this pseudo-corridor and could feel it sway slightly under his feet and at the end its purpose became evident. There he found a stand-up set of mechanical controls, several sets of wheels to spin. It took him only a few moments to work out their functions. This was a telescoping access. One wheel would cause it to stretch out to its maximum length, and as it extended, the metal bars all along its length would thin out. Other wheels allowed the controller to change the angle at which it was attached to the temple, up, down, right, left. Thoughtful use of the controls would allow its operator to place the end at some lower level on the temple building or stretch out toward a traffic lane, enabling rescue speeders to pick up those fleeing the building in time of fire or invasion. 
then spun the wheel that opened the end door. He stood out on the exit ramp and looked down. Below was the exterior wall of the temple, nearly featureless at this point, sloping slightly downward into the depths of Galactic City. All he had to do was descend, find transportation to a minor spaceport 400 kilometers away, present the false documentation that had waited with his new clothes in the locker, and board a run-down excursion transport bound for Almania. Easy. Kuat System Love Commander Establish communications, Lando said. I really think, Leia said, you're letting this whole captain thing go to your head. Lando gave her a long, thoughtful look. You're right. Dearest Leia, friend of decades, noble Jedi Knight, please do one more favor for this old, old man before his vital spirit leaves his faltering body. She gave him a long-suffering look. Forget I said anything. Ready to broadcast? No, not that. I meant, come live with me. Tendra would understand. I'm sure of it. She sighed. Yes, Han, you can shoot him. Wouldn't think of it, her husband said. If I shot him now, I'd never learn just how deep into trouble he could talk himself. Ready to broadcast now, Leia said, and pressed a switch on the comm board. This is Beskat Ofterman, Master of the Love Commander, Lando said, approaching the air adventure. Do you read, Venture? Over. Errant Venture Flight Coordination here, Love Commander. We read you. On Lando's display, the distant view of the Errant Venture, the galaxy's sole star destroyer to bear a lurid red paint job, faded and was replaced by the face of a young red Twi'lek woman. Narrow orange and yellow piping had been artfully applied to her leku, and the top portion of her clothing visible at the bottom of the screen, suggested she was wearing a black evening dress rather than a ship's uniform. We have a reservation and landing authorization. Love, Commander, and the old clown squadron of fun. The woman glanced down, presumably at a data screen. So you do. You're cleared for landing. Her voice trailed off, and she looked again obviously not prepared for what she'd seen. In the flag hangar, I'm sending a guidance beacon on your frequency now. Thank you. The Twi'lek smiled, and the screen went dark. What's a flag hangar? Lando asked. The Venture's an old Imperial Star Destroyer, Han said, shrugging. Commissioned as the virulence. I know that. Lando said. Well, except I forgot its original name. Whenever an ISD served as the flagship for a task force or fleet, Han went on, the commanding admiral would be aboard with his own quarters and his own private hangar, which was called the flag hangar. Ah. Lando nodded wisely. So, Han, old buddy, how long has it been since your academy education has come in useful? Now, Han said, I'm going to shoot him. Corellian Exclusion Zone Anakin Solo, Command Salon In the holocom transmission, Luke looked as serene as usual. But even so, Jason could sense that the Grand Master was impatient, distressed. Mara, beside him, didn't bother to hide it. Her expression was a mix of worry and anger. Without preamble, Luke said, Jason, where's Ben? Jason gave him a confused look. I take it from the question, that he's not where he's supposed to be. Luke nodded. That's correct. I notice you didn't answer my question directly. Jason felt a flash of anger. How dare Luke assume he was hiding something? The fact that he was did not enter into things. Luke needed to treat him with more respect. 
It was a lesson he had to make sure Luke learned. That would be soon, he hoped. Do you see conversational ploys in every discussion, Luke? The way he spoke the Grand Master's familiar name was just short of insulting. All right, then. Let me be absolutely clear. I don't know where Ben is. That was the truth. Lumia was monitoring Ben's mission, not Jason. Even if Jason had been lying, he was sure Luke would not have been able to detect it. Jason had been proficient at concealing his true feelings and emotions for a long, long time. He'd grown even better at it under Lumia's tutelage. Luke was silent for long moments. Finally, he said, I'm sorry, but we're worried. He disappeared from the temple, and we can't find any sign of where he's gone. Can you feel him in the Force? Yes, but that doesn't mean he's safe, just that he's alive, somewhere, and not close. Jason sighed. He's too old to be running away from home like this. My guess is he resents the fact that you took him away from me. And you know that suggests you were right. If he's going to be doing things like this, he may not be mature enough to be my apprentice. At least not yet. Luke and Mara exchanged a quick look. It seemed like a neutral exchange, but Jason could read it as though it were a large text news feed. They were thrown off by his admission that they might have been right all along. He exulted in his power to position their emotions. Mara said, Has he communicated in the last couple of days? Jason shook his head. I received a text message from him explaining some ways he planned to make Luke move his feet in sparring. That was the last I heard from him. Of course, he added, if he's run away from home and can find a way to get off planet, he'll probably come here, to me. If that happens, I assume you want me to send him straight back. That's correct, Mara said. And even if he doesn't show up there, if you find out anything about where he might be, I'll transmit it to you instantly, Jason promised. Thanks, Jason. Luke waved to something outside the range of the holocam view, and he and Mara disappeared. Jason smiled. Causing people to think and feel what he wanted them to, even without resorting to the Force, was becoming easier and easier, even with difficult subjects, like the almighty Luke Skywalker. Kuat System Errant Venture Love Commander followed the Pulsar Skate into the flag hangar, with the two X-Wings bringing up the rear. Waiting at the doors leading out of the hangar was Booster Tarek. The old man certainly wasn't diminished by age, Han decided. Burly and gray-bearded, he floated around on a hover chair as massive as the front end of an airspeeder. But he stood up out of the chair as the skate's boarding ramp came down and Mirax dashed down it. He might be too old to walk long distances, but he was certainly not going to be caught sitting down for a reunion with his daughter. Lando, Han, and Leia were toward the back of the greeting line. Wedge, Iella, and Miri also embraced the old man. Han and Leia shook his hand. Corin, Booster's son-in-law, was last to approach and did the same, his rueful expression suggesting he still hadn't quite forgiven himself for coming to like Booster. Booster finally sat again and fixed a glare on Corin. But you didn't bring my grandchildren. Corin folded his arms. They're scattered to the four corners of the galaxy on Jedi business. Not my fault. Humph! The old man fixed his stare on Mirax. Your husband still can't do simple math. You can't scatter two children to four corners. Mirax's grin grew broader. Jedi think that everybody can be divided into fractions. Come on, Father. We really need to talk. 
They settled into a private conference room only a few paces from the flag hanger. The black, gleaming sideboard had been set out with finger foods, alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks, and sealed sabac decks with holographic images of the errant venture on the backs of the cards. Most people present settled for the food and alcohol-free beverages, but Mary took a sabac deck and practiced shuffling, stacking the deck, and palming cards. Leah watched the sophisticated card sharps techniques for a few moments before turning her attention to the others. So, Booster said, and pointed at Han and Leia. Everybody in the galaxy wants to arrest you two, except the Hapens, some of whom want to investigate you, and some of whom just want to kill you. Are you going to get the venture blown up? What's the matter? Han asked, his voice taunting. No sympathy for someone everybody is chasing? Booster snorted. Good answer. Leia knew that he'd been a smuggler before she had been born, and had been sought for his crimes by both Corellian security and the Empire. Corin's father, Corsac agent Halhorn, had arrested him, and the man had spent years on the mining prison of Kessel. These days he was reformed, legitimate, about as much as Han Solo. All right, Booster continued. What is this all about? I'm sure you know all the public facts about the Corellia GA War, Wedge said. I'm equally sure you're running odds. Booster nodded. When your retirement ceremony was broadcast, odds went to thirty-seven to one for total conquest of Corellia, unless the Bothans come in, at which point it goes to fourteen to one for a negotiated conclusion with the Bothans selling the Corellians out and getting the Rancor's share of the deal. Wedge's face twitched. Right. Anyway, the public records don't talk about the fact that there are odd, unexplained variables at work here. The pressures that have brought this war into being are unambiguous, easy to identify. But there's additional string-pulling going on that is harder to bring into focus. Such as, Lando said, efforts by different groups that would like to take Han and Leia out of the equation. Take the assassinations of the Bothan politicians on Coruscant. If they were done by Corellians to bring the Bothans in, why haven't those agents also targeted major figures like Cha Neothel to deprive the GA of some of its strategic strengths? Or Jason Solo? as revenge for all the Corellian prisoner-taking. Things aren't adding up. Wedge said, My instincts tell me that if you bet on all the forces lining up to keep the Bothans out of the war failing, you'll make a good return on your bet. Hold on, Booster said. He spoke to the right arm of his chair. Log that tip. Logged, the chair said its voice that of a female protocol droid. And then there's the whole thing with ghosts appearing and persuading previously rational people to do very bad things, Leia said. That strongly suggests a Force user, a Darksider in all likelihood, if the goal is to help war happen. If there is somebody pulling strings, Han said, that rotter is probably on Corellia or Coruscant. That's where most of the puppets are dancing. And I'm talking about people like Cal Omas and Der Gedgen being puppets. We sort of stowed away on the Antilles Horn rendezvous with you, Booster, Leia said. But on the flight out here, she glanced at Han, we came to the conclusion that the errant venture would be an incredible resource for gathering information. Park it in the Corellian system where there are thousands of restless military personnel, provide gambling and entertainments, people get drunk, talk more freely. Han added, And it's not as though there'd be a big financial loss. Thousands of restless military personnel, like Leia says. Booster snorted. You think I'm so old I don't notice financial opportunities anymore? Princess! I applied for access to the Corellian Exclusion Zone the day it was established. 
The GA has been sitting on my application ever since. Leia resisted the urge to take offense. Somehow, when Booster used the word princess, he made it a comment about a spoiled little girl rather than an acknowledgment of her former title. But she refused to rise to the bait. She simply nodded. I'm glad you have no objection. So now all I have to do is get your application approved. Booster gave her a dubious look. Because you and Captain Bloodstripes there are so well loved by the government now. Leia matched him stare for stare. No, because Jason Solo swings a big lightsaber with the blockade forces. And if Luke Skywalker tells him that letting the errant venture set up there is a terrible, terrible idea, Jason will probably accelerate its approval so fast you'd think he slapped a hyperspace engine on it. It hurt to speak dismissively of her own son's powers of critical thought, but it had for some time been obvious that Jason was not entirely logical when it came to his relationship with Luke. Jason resented his uncle and balked at Luke's advice. Painful as it was, Leia now found it useful to exploit the fact. Oh! <sighs> Booster thought about it for a second, and then was distracted by more of Miri's prestidigitation. All right, girl, you can stop it. You're hired. Miri froze in mid-shuffle and looked at him, wide-eyed. Huh? You were applying for a job, right? She shook her head, bewildered. I was practicing. Mom says it's an area where I'm weak. Booster turned his glare on Iella. Meaning you're better at it than your daughter? Both women nodded. All right, then, Booster said. Iella, you're hired, too. Iella smiled. Only if we get the approval for Corellia. But if we do, Miri and I will work for free. Hey, Miri protested. Well, for tips. Done, Booster said. He turned back to Leia. And done. Drop the word to your brother. And while we're waiting for the approval you're so confident about, slap some paint or fake fur on those two famous faces of yours and enjoy yourselves aboard Air Adventure. He smiled almost benignly. Spend lavishly. Tip your hosts and hostesses. Coruscant, Zorp House Apartment Tower You're sure, Mara said. The Nemoidian male gave her a half-bow, appropriate to an acknowledgment on Coruscant, but insultingly deficient on worlds where the precise angles of such gestures spoke volumes about one's intent and attitude. I am absolutely sure, he said, his speech flavored with the musicality of his native tongue. As ever, I cooperate fully with the Jedi Order, with the Galactic Alliance Guard, with— With anyone who pays, Luke said, and you have been well paid. I have been well promised. The Nemoidian answered. Not so much paid yet. Then show us, Mara said. The Nemoidian pressed a sequence of buttons on the control panel of the turbo lift. Its status display switched from hold to one. Then the numbers began climbing as the turbo lift did. Mara felt the car accelerate. But turbo lifts in habitation buildings as lavish as this one had small inertial compensators to make rapid ascents and descents comfortable. When you contacted me, the Nemoidian said, you asked for com records from the quarters of your suspect and for other anomalies in the security recordings. Mara nodded. Weeks earlier, meticulous police work, tracking from the site of the murder of Jedi Master Tracina Lobi, had led to this building and the realization that the Sith Lady Lumia was one of the murderers. Even more unwelcome was the fact, gained from examination of the quarters, that Lumia had strong ties to the Galactic Alliance Guard. That revelation had thrown more suspicion on Jason, the Guard's operational commander. 
the investigators and the GAG took everything from her quarters. The Nemoidian said, The turbo lift came to a halt at the 288th floor. Its doors opened onto a broad hallway, lined with walls that gleamed like crushed gemstone. The Nemoidian stepped out, and the Jedi followed. They also took records from the security office, records, privately owned data pads, legally registered blasters, and restraining devices, a servitor droid, half-eaten food. Yes, yes. Luke didn't sound impatient, but he wouldn't have interrupted if he weren't. But you found something anyway. Of course. We had backups on all the security recordings, and I found that the suspect's most frequent communication through the building's comm system was to herself, from one installed unit to a second installed unit. Mara shrugged. A common practice in intelligence circles. She would have sensors attached to her comm, measuring noise, resistance, and so forth, to determine whether the unit or the comm lines were tapped. Ah! Into that one word, the Nemoidian squeezed a tremendous amount of self-appreciation. Not so. He led the way along the glittery corridor, past two sets of residential double doors, and stopped at a smaller, unmarked door. He held up a data pad and keyed in a number. The door popped open with a quiet whoosh, indicating that a seal had broken, and warmer air washed over the Jedi. The Nemoidian pulled the door open. The room beyond was dark until glow rods above blinked on, illuminating a narrow chamber lined with stored goods, cleaning solutions, deactivated mouse droids, bins of replacement electronic parts. You see, three hours ago I plugged new comms into her comm jacks and sent a message from one to the other. It never arrived. Yet sending a message from the second to the first, that one did arrive. Ah, Mara offered him a slight smile, the first sign of approval she'd given him. And here is where the interception was taking place. I did not touch it, he said. I remember your words about traps. Bombs. Poisons. He offered a shudder. I have left it for you. Where is it? Before I tell you, I wish to leave. To have a head start in case you trigger an unfortunate event. And before I leave, I wish to be paid. For if you are dead, I can never be rewarded for my efforts. Mara exchanged a glance with Luke. He nodded confirming that he, too, had detected no sign of deception in the Nemoidian story. Luke pulled a cred card from his pouch and handed it over. Thirty seconds, he said. The Nemoidian half bowed again. In anticipation of close timing, I left the turbo lift on standby. He gestured upward to the top of the shelving directly above Luke's head. And then he turned and ran. Luke snorted, amused. Mara leapt up, and with a little propulsion boost through the force, landed seated on the top shelf. What the Nemoidian had found was obvious. In his search, he had removed a ceiling panel that provided access to a series of data cables and water pipes. Spliced into one of those cables was a commercially available data pad. Mara brought out her electronics tools, and got to work on it. Luke remained at floor level. Is it a trap? Of course. With gloves, tongs, and tools, she already had the exterior panels off the data pad. The battery compartment has a smaller-than-standard battery, plus an explosives charge, just enough to destroy the data pad and blow your hand off. Belatedly, she felt a little twinge of sympathy and looked down at her husband. Oops, Sorry, farm boy. Luke glanced at his new hand. That sounds like a small charge from someone as dedicated to overkill as she seems to be. It is. She returned her attention to the device. That's because it's backed up by poison. Trihexalon beneath a very thin layer of spray-on sealant. How nice that I didn't touch it. I'd be dead. The bomb would go off. The rest of the poison would go gaseous, the explosion would breach the air duct, the duct would draw the gas in, 
Economical. Got it. Diffused. Now. She set the poison and explosives package aside, then swiftly cabled in her own data pad. After a brief analysis, she said, A simple intercept and redirect. Communications from 307.12 Alpha to 307.12 Beta are intercepted and redirected to Neg 3413. Basement level 3? Is that bedrock level? Yes, more close to it. Mara disconnected her data pad, restored the panel over Lumia's pad, and placed the explosives and poison package into a self-sealing container. Then, tools and container in hand, she dropped to the floor. I think we need to see another set of quarters. Chapter 10 The bedrock level quarters were far less impressive than those on upper stories. The hallway walls were plascrete, painted in neutral blue, and otherwise undecorated. The ceilings were low. The doors were flimsy-looking metal, with large package delivery slots beside them. There was a smell to this level, an inescapable odor of a chemical sanitizing agent, suggesting an attempt by management to combat the leakage of sewage or industrial runoff. As Mara was performing her check of the electronics on the door into the suspect quarters, Luke saw two beings, a Gamorian and a human, leaving other sets of quarters. Both were clad in blue jumpsuits emblazoned with the Zorp House Apartment Tower logo. They barely glanced at the Jedi before heading off toward the turbo lifts. Looks as though this floor is mostly quarters for building workers, Luke said. Mara nodded. Mostly or entirely, which makes me wonder how Lumia got a place here. Did she forge an ID and records, which is certainly within her capabilities, or did she bribe the building manager, and it's just a little detail he's conveniently forgotten? Oh, here we go. Stand back. She stepped away from the doorway, and though he felt no presence of danger, Luke did likewise. The door slid aside with a scraping noise, suggesting that it needed to be realigned on its rails. The Jedi waited a moment for traps to spring, then cautiously entered. This set of quarters wasn't a hovel, but it was primitive. The main room, four meters by five, opened via a curtained doorway into a short hall. Doors there accessed two bedrooms, a kitchen with minimal facilities, and a refresher. The walls and ceiling were the same blue as the halls outside, and the floor was covered by a thin, springy, off-white pad, scuffed here and there, but clean. There was no furniture other than a sleep mat in one bedroom and a chair in the main room. Luke and Mara moved cautiously from room to room, inspecting every closet and cabinet, turning the chair over, unscrewing panels from walls to see if anything was hidden. In one bedroom closet were two Zorp House apartment tower jumpsuits in Lumia's size. Mara paused while looking through them. Luke saw her nostrils flare, and then she pulled the garments from the closet, tossed them to the floor, and leaned in to study the back of the closet. Something? Luke asked. A hidden panel concealing a locking mechanism. I think the whole back of the closet is a doorway. You? The alert diode on the package delivery slot was disabled. Something was delivered since the last time she was here. A data card. Go ahead and run it. I'm going to be a minute or two here. Luke slid the unlabeled card into his data pad and watched a password prompt and a couple of lines of analysis text pop up on his screen. Encrypted, he said. We'll need to run it on a computer with some decryption muscle. Mara's reply sounded like muttered swearing in Hutties. Luke didn't know whether she was reacting to his statement or to the persistent unwillingness of the lock she was working on to be opened. And speaking of encryption, he continued, while I was getting at the data card, I was forwarded a message by the Temple Com system, an encrypted recording from Leia. Mara glanced back at him, her brows up. How is she? 
So-so, I think. She didn't mention Jason shooting from the Anakin Solo and killing her bodyguards. She did mention that Han was getting back to normal from the blaster shot he sustained. Good. And she asked me to do something. In a few words, he outlined Leia's request about putting a word in Jason's ear regarding the errant venture. Mara turned her attention to the locking mechanism as she considered. Sounds like a good tactic. But if you do it, you'll be conspiring with an enemy of the G.A. I know how you like to keep your nose clean. Luke offered her a dismissive little sniff. Han and Leia aren't enemies of the G.A. They're suspects in an investigation. If they're ever captured and charged, they'll be cleared. That's true. Our justice system is particularly fair and rational these days. Also, getting to the truth is always a good idea, no matter how it hurts. Besides, if you're ever strapped for credits, you can always turn me in for the reward. Mara turned again to smile at him. Luke, you always know the right thing to say. I do. She turned back and made one final adjustment to the locking mechanism. Ah, here we go. There was a faint rumble from the closet, and Mara abruptly bent over backward, flexible as a gymnast, catching her fall with one palm on the floor. A dart, if a meter-long shaft of polished durasteel could be termed a dart, flew from the closet passing over her at waist level and burying itself in the wall opposite. Luke's tone was exactly what he'd used to order a meal he wasn't interested in eating. Look out, a trap. Thank you. Mara rose. The doorway in the back of the closet opened onto blackness and admitted warm air, pungent with the smells of Coruscant's undercity. Native and Yuzhan Vong plant life, Standing water, plascrete so old that it was going to powder in places, distant sewage. Luke and Mara lit glow rods and entered. The access led to a utilities and repair tunnel. The Jedi explored it for thirty meters in one direction, twenty in the other, just far enough to confirm that its connections to bigger, more traveled tunnels were blocked by new plascrete plugs that looked solid but featured hatches cunningly textured to look like surrounding materials. Her own private means into and out of the building, Luke said. Chiefly as escape route, probably, since we know she didn't use it when she returned here after killing Master Lobi. But knowing that doesn't offer us anything. Mara sounded annoyed. The data card had better give us something— or we visit the Nemoidian and get our money back. Coruscant, Jedi Temple, Office of the Alimarar Task Force Curiously, considering the rigid militarism of his background, Jag Fell ran his task force very informally, and there were times when Jaina was quite pleased with the fact. Such as now. The office Luke had assigned them was large enough for several desks floor-to-ceiling displays, and other gear. There was even room for a speeder berth, had the office been equipped with a hatch to the outside, and Jag had filled it with exercise equipment. Today, both he and Zek were shirtless, doing chin-ups, while Jaina sat at a terminal and watched them surreptitiously. The competition, and it was a competition, though neither man would ever have admitted it, was surprisingly even. Zek could draw on the Force to boost his reserves of vitality. But he was taller, and though lean, heavier than Jag. It took him a trifle more effort to perform each chin-up, and he was still recovering from his wounds. Surgery, Bacta, Jedi healing techniques, and simple rest had worked wonders, leaving a broad, facing scar on his torso, the only visible evidence of his injury but the damage was not entirely healed. Jag, shorter and more compact, was in better shape, his muscles more clearly defined, and though he could not call upon the Force, he could call upon the stubbornness for which his ancestors, the Fell and Antilles clans, were both known. Jag paused at the top of a chin-up. So, time has gone by and we've seen no sign of Alima. 
We've added our monitoring program to the security systems of the temple, the portions of the Senate building that would permit it, the building where the Skywalkers keep their civilian quarters, and other places where they are occasionally seen, and we haven't seen a single flag drop. Zack, we're doing this all wrong. We should be doing sit-ups instead. Jag scowled, then lowered himself and began another ten repetitions. Jedi humor. No, that's not what I mean. He means, Jaina said, that Uncle Luke isn't the Lima's current target. Otherwise, she'd have been detected. Meaning that Mom's the target. Ah. Zek finished his set, then dropped to the floor and reached for a towel. So we track your mother down. Jaina shook her head. If it were that easy, Alima would have done it already. Jag, grunting his way through one more group of ten, which would put him, Jaina noted, exactly and deliberately ten ahead of Zek, nodded, finished his set, and dropped to the floor. We need to get the monitoring software installed in places where your parents might show up. Smugglers' havens, casinos, and trouble spots. Here, around the galaxy, even on Corellia. He paused to consider that last possibility. I wonder if Galactic Alliance Intelligence could swing that. A current from the vent on the far wall carried air to Jaina, and she wrinkled her nose. It won't take intelligence to figure out where that smell comes from. You both need to head to the refresher for a Santa steam. Not to put it too delicately, you stink. Jag looked at Zack and gestured toward the door. After you. No, after you. I'm smaller, so I stink less. A logical calculation. After you. Zek frowned, but obviously seeing no way to slide past Jag's stubbornness or superior rank, wrapped the towel around his neck and left. Jaina sighed to herself. Zek had declared that he was over her, but as he'd recovered, he had grown increasingly reluctant to leave her alone in Jag's company. He didn't need to bother. Jag clearly tolerated her only because it was his job. He had as much told her so the day Luke had assigned her to him. And yet, since the discomfort of their first couple of meetings, he had grown less icy, his words less punitive. She wondered if he had begun to forgive her for her role in costing him, well, everything. About the only things he still possessed were his body and his skills, not that she hadn't always admired both. She stomped on that intrusive thought as though it were a bug in the kitchen. Things were finished with Zack except for friendship, partnership. Things were finished with Jag except for professional cooperation. And, she hoped, a respect that would someday overcome the resentment he felt. She was done with men. She was lucky in war, unlucky in love. And she was the sword of the Jedi. It might take her a lifetime to learn what that meant, what her destiny was, and she couldn't afford to lose her focus just because she was tempted to jump into another doomed love affair. She became aware that Jag was still standing, waiting. Was there something else, Colonel? Inwardly, she winced. Even to her own ears, her tone sounded dismissive, and she'd addressed him by the military rank that had been stripped from him, as if it had been her intent to rub salt into an injury. Jag flipped his towel across his neck, his action mimicking Zex, and showed her a forced smile. Colonel! I suppose not, Jedi Solo. He turned and strode from the room. She rose to follow, then stopped herself. She hadn't meant to sting him. She had inherited her mother's sharp tongue but lacked the diplomatic skills that Leia used to keep it in check when appropriate. But perhaps it was better this way. She needed to keep him at bay. But she didn't want to hurt him. She didn't know how to achieve both goals. She didn't even know whether she wanted to achieve both goals. Or either. Sometimes she wanted to hurt him. Sometimes she didn't want to keep him at bay. Blast him for getting past her armor. 
Kamenor, President's Residence. The hala transmission was in the image of a woman, a beautiful woman, her features aristocratic and refined in the inbred hapen fashion, almost to the point of anonymity. She's a generic hapen, Fior Rodan told himself, and the startling thought made him more suspicious of her. Your war and intelligence ministers argue and delay, the woman was saying. She shook her head in sad sympathy, sending her golden curls swaying. Knowing that your fleet will be wiped out by the Galactic Alliance forces if they make a misstep, and that would be catastrophic, but delaying will also be disastrous. Corellia will fall soon and then attacking would be suicide. Soon the G.A. will turn its attention to Commonor, to what it perceives as Corellia's treason, and you will fall too. Rodan snorted. You're clearly proficient at cutting through the layers of disinformation we surround ourselves with to keep people like you from taking up too much of our time. But that doesn't make you correct in your assumptions. Yes, the government of Kaminor has spoken out against Alliance aggression and for Corellian independence. That's not an act of war, as readying a fleet would be. The unnamed woman gave him a slightly superior smile. For a man, you've done a superb job of instituting on Kaminor, the kind of government you advocated for the New Republic. There are no loose turbo cannons like the Jedi Order rolling around on your decks. But the same caution that convinced you to keep the Jedi at bay could doom you now. Though I don't think it will. You're clever. For a man, he added mockingly. For a man. Her reply was straight-faced. I'm going to do you two favors. I'm now transmitting a package of data I have obtained from my sources within the Galactic Alliance Guard. Fabio? The next voice belonged to someone not in the holocam view. Transmitting, mistress. Rodan forced himself not to grimace. He imagined the speaker as a heapen drone male, his body perfectly maintained through exercise regimens, for the pleasure of the woman he called mistress, his mind stunted by the pampered life he led. The woman continued, These are the plans by which the G.A. will conquer Kaminor, exactly one month after the fall of Corellia. I see, Rodan said, keeping his voice neutral. Your people will analyze them and confirm their authenticity, she continued. Establishing my authenticity. Then, in a few days, I will transmit you the time and movements of other fleets that will be moving on Corellia, fleets that by themselves perhaps cannot prevail, fleets that with the aid of Kaminor must prevail. Thank you for your transmission, my lady, Rodan said. She smiled. Her image winked out. Rodan checked his comm display to make sure that the transmission had been cut, and that the data package was intact and in his computer. Then he sat for long moments, still on the outside, vibrating on the inside. Much of what the woman had said was true, especially the part about his minister's dithering. If the woman also spoke truly about the conquest plans, Rodan had to act. His ministers had to act. VL-8, he said. Instantly, his secretary droid was beside him. Yes, sir. Transmit that data file to the ministers of war and intelligence, plus to everyone on our top military analysis list. Encrypt it to top levels, and attach a note saying that it must be evaluated. Then set up a meeting for me and all those parties for midday tomorrow. Yes, sir. Star System MZX-32905, near Bimiel. 
Lumia waited until her medical droid was set up beside her reclining chair. She was healing well. She should be fit to return to physical activities within a few days. She was still weak, though and wanted care to be instantly available if this task caused her to collapse. She closed her eyes and let the dark side power that suffused the asteroid roll over her, through her. Then she began looking through the Force for a distant target, a mind she had touched many times and reshaped during those contacts, a mind she had made so familiar and distinct she could find it even halfway across the galaxy. It helped that she knew on what world the mind was to be found. But even so, it was long, wearying minutes before she found it. To her inner eye, it was a distinctive yellow glow, surrounded by tiny gleaming sparks of red. Fewer sparks than before. The efforts of the enemy to diminish her influence had apparently been successful in part but only in part. Lumia smiled. The enemy's techniques were nowhere near as effective as hers. She approached the mind until it filled her vision, and she planted herself there, making its location an anchor point for her consciousness. Now for the second phase of this elaborate Sith technique. She drew back from her target mind, seeking other mentalities in the area. And there they were, glows of various hues, none of them, sadly, decorated with the red sparks of her influence. She sampled each in turn. Most were awake, firm, more resolute than she could affect at this distance. Others were too fragmented. When she touched them they tended to drift apart into smaller, incoherent glows, and she knew that these were the minds of the inmates, the patients. Then she found one that was firm, grounded, but not so resistant to her touch. Its owner was asleep. Lumia sampled it further, found it to be the mind of a Quarren female. Like a spectral parasite, she affixed herself to that mind, forging a connection, drawing energy out of it and the body that sustained it. She could not draw that energy into herself, though she badly needed sustenance now. She could feel her own body begin to shake from the strain. But she could, and would, put the energy to use. Finally, she flowed into the distant Quarren's mind, flowed out through its memory of its surroundings, and she could see. She hovered above the Quarren. The amphibious female was dressed in medical scrubs, and leaned across a desk, sleeping there. This was a small office, packed with and lit solely by computer displays. A window looked out over a facing wall of building fronts, and there were for once no traffic streams to be seen. A door, ajar, led into a brightly lit corridor. Lumia got to work. Into the woman's sleeping mind she whispered, "'Open your eyes.' Stand up. We have work to do, records to read, instructions to issue. And the Quarren rose, her eyes glazed, her face tentacles twitching. Minutes later, Lumia restored the Quarren to her desk and true sleep, then drifted from the chamber to find someone, a very useful someone. Galactic City, Coruscant, Veterans Mental Care Hospital Matrick Klauskin, former commander of the Second Fleet's Corellian Task Force, but for the last several weeks a patient in this too sympathetic prison, awoke. The small room he'd been given was as always dark and quiet, its few items of furniture reflecting white gleams from the city lights filtering in through the transparasteel viewport. Everything was as it should be. Or perhaps not. The door was open. He frowned. The door opened only when the doctors or nurses came for him, 
or when his caseworker from the Alliance's Naval Administration visited to reassure him that all was well. They hadn't forgotten him. But now the door was open, and no one was entering. He sat up, his sheet falling from his chest, and realized that someone was standing beside his bed. He looked up. It was Adela. Of course it was Adela. His treatment here was all about his wife. Now she smiled down at him, patient and loving as always. Tonight she wore a shimmering synth-silk gown of burgundy. She had lost weight, diminishing from the pretty but distinctly overweight woman she had been the last time he'd seen her, to a figure he could describe as pleasingly plump. The gray was gone from her hair, too, and he realized belatedly that she wasn't just slimmer. She was younger. She looked as she had a mere five or ten years into their marriage. Hello, dear, he said. You realize you're dead. Her smile broadened. Of course I'm dead. I've been dead for years. But it doesn't mean I don't exist. Well, that's the point, isn't it? The doctors all say that you don't. That your very existence rests only in my mind. But they say I'm getting better. I don't exist just in your mind. I exist in fact. Phantoms of the mind can't open a door and free you, can they? Klauskin looked again at the door. It remained resolutely open. That just means I'm dreaming again. It's really not open. It is, as you'll find out in a moment. Her voice became urgent. Darling, you've been lied to. We've all been lied to. The Corellians have been in the right all along, and we've betrayed our own people by opposing them. Klauskin frowned. He knew his thinking was muddled but he couldn't see how he was harming his homeworld of Commonor by opposing Corellia. True, Commonor's government had offered words of encouragement to Corellia, but that was just politics at work. Adela continued, Commonor and Bathawi are coming into the war on Corellia's side, and you, darling, have been imprisoned here and convinced that you're ill, just so the Alliance can keep you from helping our world. Klauskin sighed. Truth was such a slippery concept these days that he found it hard to trust, even his dead wife. You're either here or not. There was a little curiosity in Adela's voice. True. And I'm either a prisoner or a patient. True. And Commodore and Bathawi are either in the war or not. True. I have to know the truth, and the truth is in what can be verified. I'm sorry, darling. I'm going to go through that open door and then wake myself up. If I don't wake up, then what you say is true. Don't apologize, Matrick. I know these are difficult times for you. Klauskin rose. His bare feet were cold on the tile floor. He walked out through the door, looking up and down the corridor at the other doorways. They were all closed. Adela followed and joined him. Klauskin raised his hand to his lips and bit the webbing between his thumb and forefinger. It hurt. He kept the pressure on, biting deeper, and tasted blood. He held the bite until he couldn't stand the pain any more. And finally, he let his arm swing to his side again. Weary, he said, I'm convinced. Good, because you have a lot to do. I'm going to lead you out of this prison. Outside, a friend will give you clothes— transportation and documents. Her expression turned to one of sympathy. You've been a hero of the Alliance for so long. 
but they turned against you, and it's time to be a hero of Kaminoor again. Star System MZX-32905, near Bimiel. Lumia gave Klauskin one last sweet kiss as he stood on the walkway outside the mental hospital. The shaking her real body was experiencing almost reflected itself in trembling in Adela's arms, but she maintained ruthless control. Then she let Adela fade away to nothingness. Her consciousness roared back into her own body. That's when the pain and weakness hit hard. She spasmed, sitting upright, and nearly rolled out of her reclining chair. She forced herself to lie down again. She lay there, her limbs twitching, even the artificial ones. My lady, the medical droid asked, can you hear me? Yes. Feebly she waved fingers at him, trying to dissuade him from unnecessary conversation. This session had gone longer than most, and had been worse than most. It would take her longer to recover. She wondered what would have happened if she had continued it to the point of her own collapse. Would she have died? Or would she be trapped on Coruscant, in the phantasmal body of a long-dead military wife, forever hovering around a man she had deliberately driven crazy? She didn't know the answer. And it didn't matter. She had succeeded, and Klauskin would now dutifully go about accomplishing her plans— the Galactic Alliance had been so circumspect about covering up the details of Klauskin's mental breakdown. They thought they were being merciful, that if Klauskin was able to effect a recovery, he could someday resume command, even if a lesser one. His official record said only that he was on administrative leave, which could result from a physical injury or an urgent family problem. He still held his admiral's rank and command rating and in not informing the fleet that Klauskin was dangerously delusional. They had doomed... had doomed... On that thought, she fell asleep. Drua, Moon of Almania, Drua Spaceport Customs inspections, Ben decided, are very inconvenient. The transport ride to the Outer Rim system of Almania had been long and dull. Ben spent most of it reading Jedi texts on his datapad. Texts about his grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, he'd been given as preparation for the document he was supposed to write. Or sleeping. He interacted very little with his fellow passengers, preferring not to become memorable to them. Finally, the transport had landed on the heavily industrialized moon of Drua with its high-security spaceport and its carefully regimented customs facility. Ben stood in the inspection line, his small pack and his belt pouch in hand, and prepared to enter the twenty-meter-long sensor tube. There he would be scanned a dozen different ways, and at the end his belongings would be laid out on a table and hand-inspected, with anything the sensors had flagged receiving special attention. There was no way his lightsaber would remain undetected if he carried it through the tube. The tube allowed access through a security wall that was seven or eight meters tall, and there was a three-meter gap between the top of the wall and the drafty-looking shell of the ceiling. There were lots of glow-rod pods up there on either side of the wall. Ben could bound to the top of the metal awning above the tube entrance and might be able, with a prodigious leap, to make the top of the wall. He could then run along the top of the tube, clear the wall on the far side, and run out into the non-secure portion of the customs building to vanish into the night. Assuming it was night out there. And the holocams all over the facility would record his face, and his image would be on every guard's data pad in an hour. That would be inconvenient. Then he thought about the Jedi Temple practice droid and its foam steel balls, and he knew what to do. He looked up and found a glow-rod pod well behind him. He reached out through the force to grab it. Yank it. It rocked a bit. Ben frowned. It was firmly rooted. 
He focused harder, putting all his intensity into his concentration. The pod snapped free of its mooring and crashed to the permacrete floor, its cluster of dozens of glow rods shattering and sending glass pieces skidding along the floor in every direction. As everyone looked, and one armed guard trotted over to see what had happened, Ben used the force to send his lightsaber up to the ceiling. There, above the glow rods, it was barely visible. He caused it to slide across the ceiling until it came to rest above a pod on the far side of the wall. And then, with meticulous care, he lowered it until it nestled into the cluster of rods. You're holding up the line, stupid! The speaker was an elderly woman, as lean as though she were made up of just bone and rawhide, a disapproving look on her face. Sorry, Ben said. He trotted forward into the tube. Sorry doesn't mean anything. If you were sorry, you wouldn't have done it in the first place. Sorry. Now you're being insolent. Sorry. Ben thought about using his powers to cause her to trip. A face full of permacrete might scrub the disapproval off her face. No, she was old, and she might really be hurt. On the other hand, it would teach her a lesson, and she could stand to be taught a lesson. At the far end of the tube, he handed over his bag and pouch to the gray-uniformed inspection officer and waited, frowning over the question of the old woman. What would Jason do in this situation? Ben shook his head. The question didn't apply. No one would have spoken to Colonel Jason Solo that way, even before he was famous. Why not? Because he was tall and handsome? No. Luke wasn't tall, and was only as handsome as his scarred face let him be, and yet everyone treated him with respect. Luke and Jason commanded respect because everyone knew it was a bad idea to mess with them from either their appearance or their history, which meant that Ben was out of luck, because he had neither fame nor formidable looks. The old woman fussed her way up behind Ben. "'You're a very nasty little boy,' she said. Ben glared up at her. "'I take it back.' "'You take what back? My apology. I apologized, but you didn't accept it. You just used it as an excuse to keep being rude.' You have the manners of a bantha with digestion problems. If you had children, I hope they were raised by piranha beetles so they'd be nicer than you. The woman loomed up over him, her face distorting with anger, and Ben saw in her mind her intent to slap some of what she considered courtesy into him. But he intensified his glare and added to it a little push with the force. Try it, he all but said. See what I become. A bit of grayness crept into her complexion, and she took an involuntary step back. She turned stiffly away from Ben, handing her bag to her inspections officer, and looked at everything but Ben, muttering to herself. Ben's inspections officer handed his bag back to him. He also offered a silent smile and a thumbs up. Surprised, Ben offered a shy smile in return. He turned and trotted toward the door out of the customs facility. There, he told himself. That's how Jason would have done it if he were my age. As he reached the door, he let his lightsaber drop into his hands, then moved out into the night air. <laughs>